everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Sunday of the month, which means it's time for Nutrition Insights with Dr. Peter Rogers. And today he's going to be discussing vegan myths and fairy tales. Please welcome Dr. Rogers back to the show. So once upon a time, huh? Fairy tales. Yes. Love it. yes. Yeah, I think it's going to be fun. Oh, well, I got one thing I'll show the audience too. Um, there's a good thing to do. You know, my wife the other day, I said, where are you going? And she says, I'm going to pick apples. And so she, she took the kids going to pick apples. And I'm like, you know me, I never do stuff like that. And I figured, well, it keeps her busy, gets her out of the house. I'll have some peace and quiet for a little while. But they came back and I'll show you what they got. A whole bunch of apples. I think that's a good idea. Because, you know, they're talking about putting that new eight pill coating on the apples. So yes. I don't know exactly what it's on. I know it's on avocados and I've heard it's on a lot of apples, but I figured, so go to those apple picking places and get a whole bunch of them. You know, now's the time to do it. Yeah. Just a lot of people, the internet. a lot of people are worried about appeal. Yeah. And, and uh, I'll talk about it a little more later, but I really don't have much new info, but um, anyways, I thought that, that just struck me as a great opportunity. Go get it. Cause it's probably, it's an industrial thing. They probably do it at some factory or something. So that sounded like a workaround there. Yeah. The worst part is, it's not that they're doing it, but that we have no say in this other yeah. than to not buy it. I went to the grocery stores and I asked them, do you got a list of what it's on, what it's not on? They're like, oh no, we don't have a list. I'm like, oh gee, that's helpful. They know they did tell me is they say, if you come at certain hours, sometimes you can go when their buyers are there, the persons who purchase stuff for the store and they might know, but the customer service people, I've never met one that's known. I've asked a bunch of them so far. Wow. Well, eat at your own risk. Yeah. It's kind of scary. Really? So uh, when I think of fairy tales, I think of, you know, like, uh, um, what's her name? Rapunzel and the three bears. Yeah, I got a whole bunch of stuff as well as a bunch of myths, like Greek myths and other things related. And I'm going to relate them all to veganism. It'll all make sense. Okay, great. Well, I'm looking forward to your presentation as always. Okay, here we go. All right, I got to start the slideshow. Oh, another thing was one of the viewers after my last lecture had asked, am I a young earth creationist? You know, and did God make the world in exactly seven days? And, you know, heck if I know, um, one day is it metaphorically represent 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years? I can't even understand my wife. How am I going to understand what God does, okay? And yeah. I asked, they asked me, do you believe in evolution? And I'm like, well, you know, I do know that one species can change into another. For example, how do you turn a fox into an elephant? You marry it. How do you turn a night oh owl? Yeah. How, how do you turn a night owl into a homing pigeon? You marry them, okay? Oh, and then they say, well, do humans really come from monkeys? And I can assure you that my family, my ancestors were created in the image of God. My wife's family, they might have evolved from monkeys. Hey, okay? Dr. Rogers, uh, my comedy class starts up again at the end of the month. Why don't you take it this time? It's on this time, it's on Wednesday night. We have another famous doctor in the class. I think he should join. That sounds like a lot of fun. I would love yeah, to. I think you'd be great. I don't see your slides yet, by the way. Oh, you, oh, you don't see them? You didn't see my slide? I haven't seen them yet. Oh, crap. I got I got up. Oh, because I have the slides, but I had to. Um, you have to press screen share. I, have, or, I hadn't screen share shared yet screen. In, in the, um, in the what do you call it, in the Zoom menu. Okay, so let me screen share in the Zoom menu. Okay, so I want to share my entire desktop. There we there go. There you go. Perfect. Now you can see me, huh? Okay. And then just in the view, you want to change the view because right now it's yeah, because I got I got to go into my program and it's got to let me do my slideshow. Yeah, it's working. There I know you I, go. Okay, so that you already got that young Earth creation stuff, right? Okay, Perfect. so I'm gonna go to the next. Slide. So you got the sound of it without the picture. Okay, all right. The next thing, one last question before I get into the slides was, you know, people ask me how do I cook. And I can just tell you, I, you know, first of all, I, I just cook starches when I'm by myself and I boil water. That's all I do. I boil water for boiled potatoes, boiled sweet potatoes, rice, beans, oatmeal, quinoa. Okay. But on a regular daily basis, I'm lucky enough that I often cook the old fashioned way. I have a woman do it. Okay. And now my muses don't help me much with writing, but they make a good dinner and people say, Oh, isn't that sexist? Everything you do nowadays, you get, you get accused of sexism. And let me tell you something. No, that's what they want. That's what my mother wanted. That's what my, that's what grandma wants, which grandma's really my mother-in-law. And that's what my wife wants. And contrary to popular legend, women are not that nice in the kitchen. Okay. There's no Florence Nightingale in the kitchen. You can't avoid the split tails in the kitchen. They're like, women are like territorial animals in the kitchen and they, main, they maintain control by yelling at anyone who goes near the sink. 
They're always saying stuff like, move, I need to peel potatoes. You're wasting water. You just splash the window, clean it up. I'm sick and tired of cleaning up after you. Turn that light off, you're wasting electricity. And I'll be like, I thought you wanted more light for peeling potatoes. And they'll go, get out of here. I'll say, you shouldn't use a metal spoon in the cooking pot. You're going to, you scratch it. You're going to put aluminum in the food. And they go, get out of here. One more thing out of you. And I'm, you're going to cook for yourself. And it's the same in the laundry room. If I'm in the laundry room and they're nearby, it's no matter how I set the controls, it's always wrong. I'm ruining the clothes. I'm going to break the machine. And, you know, even my mother was kind of like that. If she caught me brushing my teeth and rinsing my mouth over the sink, she'd say, I'm going to kill you. So, you know, for what it's worth, never, and also women, you know, in my experience, they always kind of overreact in the kitchen to almost everything. And they're always leaving around half eaten bananas. Never in my life has a guy from my brothers, my father, my teammates, fraternity brothers, roommates ever yelled at me for that sort of stuff. And I think what happens is my wife and my mother-in-law, they're trying to control me. They establish a baseline level of bitching and and I have the only way that things will be nicer is if I give into their demands and they almost always win any argument in the kitchen because they stick together and I don't have the energy to argue with them. Oh, I forgot to tell you about Rumpelstiltskin. Rumpelstiltskin story originated with there was a miller, you know, years ago who bragged that he had a daughter who could spin hay into gold. And the, the king found out and he said, OK, we'll bring her to my castle and we'll have her go out in the horse stall and spin the hay into gold. And of course, the miller had been bragging and exaggerating. And the king said, if she doesn't do it, then she will be executed. So the girl was crying. And then this man appeared, kind of this midget guy, strange looking guy. And he said, I will help you, but what will you give me? And she said, well, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you my necklace. So she gave my necklace the first night. And then the man spun the hay into gold. And then the second night, the king gave more hay. And so she gave him the ring from her finger and he spun that hay into gold. But the third night, the girl was crying and she said, oh, I have nothing else to give you to the man who could spin the hay. And uh, she also the man who could spin the hay was nice enough to spin the hay, but he was kind of a real grouchy, nasty guy. You know, she wanted the miller's daughter wanted to watch him do it because it was a valuable skill. But he said, get out of here. He was real nasty about it. And so he said, I will spin the hay this time, but you must give me your firstborn child. OK, and she's like she figured the king was going to execute her the next day anyways, if she didn't get it spun into gold. So she said, OK, fine. And the man did it. OK, and then she kind of forgot about it. About a year later, she had a baby and the little man came back. And he said, OK, that child is mine. Give it to me. And she said, no, 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 please. No. And he said, well, I'll give you one chance. I'll give you you, you give I'll give you the I'll let you try to guess my name within three days. OK, and she tried every name she could think of. She went through a name list, couldn't do it. And then she had a friend spying him and she saw the little man dancing around the fire and he said, she will never guess my name for, and I will win the game for Rumpelstiltskin is my name. So anyways, then she guessed it. Okay, so my point was, I say that my mother-in-law is like Rumpelstiltskin. She's really grouchy, but she's a great cook. And if I just stay out of her way and leave her alone in the kitchen, you know, I come back, it's all cleaned up. There's a great meal. The other day I was having some tightness in my chest, you know, a little chest pain. So I talked to a cardiologist and he said, I need a stress test. So he brought me into a room that was a combination kitchen and laundry room. And then he brought in my wife and mother-in-law. And he said I had to obey all the rules for one hour. It was very stressful. <laughs> um, you know, and Camille Pagula had said, teenage boys have only a brief season of exhilarating liberty between the control by their mothers and the control by their wives. By middle age and early old age, women have total control of their marriages. And that seems accurate in my experience. Okay. Our next topic, we're going to talk about the most memorable lines ever spoken in vegan history, the real nutrition history. So first of all, on the subject of carbohydrates, uh, Dr. John McDougall said, all healthy populations eat a starch-based diet. There are no exceptions. Humans are starchivores. And you are not incurable from any disease until you have only eaten sweet potatoes and nothing else but water for four months. Interesting. Dennis Burkett. High fiber diets protect patients from abdominal pressure syndrome. Okay, Durian Ryder said, sugar is the most powerful performance enhancer for your brain, your muscles, and your dong, according to him. Okay, on the subject of lipids, Caldwell Esselstyn, no oil, moderation kills. You only see heart disease in the countries that eat a lot of meat and oils. Coronary artery disease is a foodborne illness. Coronary artery is a toothless paper tiger that need never exist. Okay, Nathan Pritikin, fat is bad. There is no such thing as a normal occurring diet that is low, too low in fat or protein. In studies with controlled diets, people ate 0.75%, that's less than 1% fat, and they did very well. 
Okay, he's got the references to those studies in his book. Dean Ornish, it's better to make big changes than small changes because big changes generate big results and that increases motivation. Roy Swank, Central Norway eats a lot of saturated fat and they have lots of uh, multiple sclerosis, whereas coastal Norway eats much less saturated fat. That's because in the Central Norway, they had all the dairy farms. In the coastal area, they're eating more fish and other things and they have much less multiple sclerosis. Okay, the Chinese diet is mostly rice and it's very low in fat. And I don't think there's any multiple sclerosis patients in China. Okay, uh, Dr. McDougal, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Jeff Nelson uh, from VegSource, the fat in nuts is also bad for blood flow. The benefits of omega-3 fats are exaggerated, according to him. Okay, Michael Brownlee, uh, excessive dietary fat causes reversal of electron transport in mitochondria. This, this causes insulin resistance. This is a magnificent paper. He wrote the paper called Unifying Theory of Diabetic Complications. It, it's a masterpiece. One of the best papers I ever met in my life. It's a work of genius. Okay, Gerald Shulman, MD, PhD. He's the guy who was out at Yale working with nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. He said, we have confirmed that excess fat in skeletal muscle is the main cause of insulin resistance. We call this the ectopic fat theory of diabetes. These guys both won the Banting Award for diabetes research. They're both incredible geniuses. Okay, Michael Greger. There are two types of doctors, vegans and those who have not yet read the literature. Um, you know what, Dr. Rogers? I think that was credited to Dr. Kim Williams, actually. Oh, that one about there's two types of doctors? Okay, I'm yes. sorry. That's him. okay, but I, I'm pretty sure that's his line. Oh, okay. Okay, so that's Dr. Kim Williams, a cardiologist. Okay, William Roberts. When you feed them a high-fat diet, all herbivores get atherosclerosis. Humans are herbivores. Eggs are what you feed an animal to cause atherosclerosis. Because a lot of people ask me, are eggs good? For, are eggs healthy? <laughs> no, you, they're good if you want atherosclerosis. Uh, Pete Rogers. Okay. There's no such thing as good fats except secret fat, which is the conversion of fiber fat. Um, instead of trying not to be as fat as your cousin, try to be as healthy as you can be. The more profitable a disease, the less likely there will ever be a cure. Okay. On protein, T. Colin Campbell. Animal protein is the most powerful tumor promoter, especially casein. Uh, Dr. Kempner, low protein diet lowers the workload of kidneys. And he, were, he saved these kidneys uh, from dialysis and reversed uh, hypertensive retinopathy and a bunch of other things. Okay, James R. Mitchell, PhD. The less protein an animal eats, the longer it lives. And that seems to be true for humans too. He did a bunch of research on low protein diets and he referred back to Kempner's work. It was kind of impressive. He has a lecture on YouTube. Okay, Leonard Hayflick, he was um, uh, working with human tissue culture cells. And he found that somatic body cells could only divide 60 times and then they would go into senescence and die. And so he said, human somatic cells, most cells in the body, except for you know stem cells and germ cells, can only divide about 60 times before they die. That's now called the Hayflick limit. And it's quite relevant because, for example, here's Dean Ornish's quote about his work, plant-based diets and stress management help to maintain telomeres. And this slows down aging. It delays arrival at the Hayflick limit. So what happens is with every cell division, in a normal somatic body cell. Soma, soma just means body. The telomeres shrink and eventually they keep shrinking into genes that the cell needs to live. So the cell dies. And so if you don't shrink your telomeres, the cell will not die. Um, and the point is excessive psychological stress and animal food diets will shrink those telomeres and accelerate your aging and your path to death. And they also accelerate cancer growth. Okay, Anthony J, PhD, uh, lipid biochemist. There's already a truckload of negative papers on soy, okay? Uh, me, animal protein is more leucine and methionine than plant protein, and meat is high in fat and iron. All of these things activate mTOR. mTOR is the growth pathway, and it causes accelerated cell replication. So when you speed that up, you speed up age, and you speed up arrival to hay flick limit, and you speed up cancer growth. So you don't want mTOR activated. Okay, Chef AJ, the key to losing weight is to eat low caloric density food. Eat your veggies first. If it's in your house, it's in your mouth. The longer you eat simple, the better simple tastes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also if you or if anyone else has additional ones, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of them that I missed or don't know or forgot. Just put them in the comments. I'd love to hear them. I, I love that one you said about the more profitable your disease, the less likely there's going to be a cure. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Good luck challenging chemotherapy. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, Richard Moore, the reason black people have so much hypertension is because they don't eat enough potassium. It is not because of the sodium. Their sodium intake is not that high. It is because they hardly eat any processed plant foods. Populations who eat a plant diet have the same blood pressure in their teens and in their 70s. Okay, so, and it wasn't just the black population. It's all the populations that eat a high salt diet. 
But the secret is the reason like why were the Japanese relatively healthy despite eating tons of sodium, like 12, 14 grams a day, because they also ate a lot of vegetables. But if you have populations in America that are eating lots of salt, but they're not compensating for it by eating a lot of vegetables, they get relatively severe hypertension. And then everybody thinks, oh, it's the sodium, it's the sodium. No, you got you to gotta deal with the potassium. He's a guy who wrote everything about the relationship between potassium and sodium. Trust me, this is incredible stuff. And doctors don't know that. If you look at the Donison study from 1929, the Lancet Journal, they had 1,800 consecutive admissions to a hospital in Kenya. And there was not a single person with hypertension, zero, because they ate a plant-based diet. Okay, That's a big secret. The potassium is more important than the sodium. That is not widely known. Okay, um, John McDougall. It's the food, uh, Dr. Klaper and T.C. Uh, Campbell and others will be saying it's the food. That's sort of like become a pretty common mantra these days. Okay, put your faith in the food. The most common cause of autoimmune disease is leaky gut. That's not taught in medical schools or residencies. Specialists in uh, rheumatology don't know that. I've talked to them. Um, the body is always trying to heal. And the way I look at that, the body is always trying to heal is that the body will go up two steps, but if you got bad habits, you're knocking it down a step, maybe even two steps, and it's hard to generate much healing. So that's why you got to avoid all these bad habits. And then, you know, you, you, you'll progressively have a tendency to keep on healing in a good direction. Okay, uh, Dean Ornish, vegetarian diet and stress management enabled men with biopsy proven low grade prostate cancer to lower their PSA or at least keep it from increasing. So that was a magnificent study that, uh, these guys that had declined radiation or chemo or surgery for their prostate cancer and were in the so-called watchful waiting phase were able to keep their PSAs, prostate-specific antigens, as a blood test, um, same or decrease. It's the ones whose PSA bumped up who had to go on to surgery, radiation, chemo, all that stuff. So nice to control it with just uh, you know the diet and exercise, stress management stuff. Okay, Ruth Heydrich, the most common cause of disease is ignorance. It only took me two hours to become a vegan after talking to Dr. McDougall. I was a starch vegan, and then I later became a raw vegan. Both work. Both have kept me free of cancer. Uh, she was diagnosed with cancer about 40 years ago, okay? And she's been cancer-free and running marathons and triathlons, okay? Lorraine Day, you aren't sick because you have cancer. You have cancer because you are sick. You need to learn God's way of healing. It is the best treatment for most diseases, and it's free, which basically she's going to say means eat a vegan diet and manage your stress, that sort of thing. Okay, Jack Delatore, chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, well, I call them mouse equivalents, is the most common cause of dementia, meaning he's the guy who tied off the carotid artery in a mouse, and then the typical middle-aged and older mouse would become demented um, two months later, and he reasoned out that that was uh, due to cerebral hypoperfusion, a lack of blood supply to the brain, but when he did autopsies, the mouse wasn't stroked out, the mouse simply had atrophic brain on the same side he tied off the carotid, and it's a brilliant way to figure something out because it's not just tying off the carotid. Not that many people have severe carotid stenosis or occlusion. The relevance is lots of people have uh, overtreated hypertension. Overtreated hypertension, you have a mouse equivalent, aortic regurgitation, aortic stenosis, AFib, congestive heart failure. They're all mouse equivalents. Okay. All right. Uh, P. Rogers, neurovascular uncoupling is the most common cause of dementia. The deletory theory is a subset of this. Most experts focus on the heart, but I focus on the brain and the brain is much fussier. It's more than the food. It's also the toxins. I actually think that's a big spot where that the whole vegan community is screwing up, in my opinion. Let me explain what I'm saying here. Everybody knows that doctors don't know anything about nutrition. MDs don't learn anything about nutrition. And the vegan community is great in nutrition. That's their great strong point. But what I'm saying is medical doctors, MDs, and also most people in the vegan community, they have not studied toxicology much. And I think that's a big gap in the knowledge. And look at it as, instead of looking at it as a pain, oh, I got to learn all this stuff, look at it as an opportunity. It's an opportunity for improved health. It's an opportunity to help your patients, your clients, uh, learn about all this toxicology stuff. And toxicology is just things like what's in your water? What type of water filter should I use? What's the difference between organic and non-organic? What's, you know, things like that, they're useful to know. And I'm going to talk about some of that sort of stuff today with regard to Circa. Oh, these, <clears throat> these films, my last thing on my slide got uh, clipped off here. It was with regard, I talked about my spinal ischemic and chemical degeneration theory, how the spine degenerates. I look at many thousands of spines, a long story, but I, I wrote quite a bit on that. And the point is it's mostly ischemia. Just like we talk about ischemia being what damages the heart and the brain. Well, duh, it damages everything. You get total body ischemia. Okay. Now, another thing I want to share with you is I just finished reading um, sort of a biography about Samuel Johnson. The book was actually called The Club, and it was about a literary, cl literary club where he met with a bunch of fellow writers and actors and poets 
And this is back in London in the 1760s. And then I noticed that he, after he died, he was a great man of letters. He was buried in Westminster Abbey. I thought that was kind of cool. And they have something in Westminster Abbey called the Poet's Corner. And Samuel Johnson, that's his bust there of Samuel Johnson. And they have all these other famous poets. And there's quite a lot of them. And Samuel Johnson said, a nation's greatest glory is her writers. And I thought, you know, that's nice. That's interesting. And there was also this guy uh, more recently, Stephen Hawking. And he's sort of a mathematician, physicist, uh, astronomer. And he wrote the book called A Brief History of Time. And, you know, I read that book and a long time ago and I thought, you know, it's a decent book, but I don't know if this guy's really a genius. He had amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, you know, a disease similar to multiple sclerosis in some ways. And I was thinking, you know, this guy, I don't know if this guy's really a genius. And then I read while he had ALS, he's in the hospital. And while he was in the hospital, he seduced two nurses. And I'm saying to myself, if some guy with ALS could be in the hospital and seduce two nurses, he must really be a genius. Okay, then here is the area for the coronation at Westminster Abbey. And I thought to myself, you know, that's nice. Here's a beautiful painting of Queen Victoria at her Jubilee celebration in Westminster Abbey having um, the, you know, the celebration there is very nice. And I thought to myself, you know what? We ought to have the same thing for the nutrition world. And Chef AJ's name is Abby J. So I thought we, we could call our building Abby J. Abby. I you love know? that. I love that. That's a funny yeah and uh you know i think the first year we could elect um the king and queen of the nutrition world every two years and we'll start out with uh caldwell esselstyn and chef aj and i think that would be very nice uh-huh i love it um they also have a choir area in, in the abbey and and they'll sing some songs here so i wrote a little song for the occasion amazing starch how sweet the sound that saved a slob like me. I once was fat, but now I'm thin. Was blind, but now I see. So anyways, I don't got much of a voice, but- Oh, that's great. I think it works. And there's other songs. On, I, I'm not going to you know, sing because I know nobody wants to hear that, but I just had a little fun. Look at the words here. You can take a lot of songs like, here we go around the mulberry bush and um, make different versions. Like here's the big farmer version. This is the way we drug the proles, drug the proles, drug the proles. This is the way we fleece the proles, fleece the proles, fleece the proles. I don't know, I had a little fun with that. I don't know if anybody thinks that funny, but I enjoyed it. Okay, now another nice thing I noticed is they've got a lot of sculptures on the walls. And I figured this would be a way to make money that we could generate some funding to make the vegan Abbey Pantheon, okay? Um, and these statues, they kind of remind me like an action figure. So each financial donor could get like an action figure statue of themselves in there. And we could also have like, you know, in the, in the Middle Ages, they had guilds and the guilds would fund things. OK, so, for example, take a look at this painting. What guild do you think funded this painting? It's the Archer's Guild. Notice how his body is like shaped like a bow and arrow. And he's like pulling back on the legs. And notice how her position echoes his position. So that was the idea. It's a beautiful painting from 1435. I think it's magnificent. That's what the guild funded. And I think we should have the same thing for the modern medical guilds, okay? We've got guilds. Oh, by the way, there's also statues outside the building. You know, here's a gargoyle, and this looks like some form of, you know, eagle or something. So I thought we could do the same thing with the different medical profession guilds, okay? For example, radiology department could have a statue of someone having a barium edema to symbolize radiology. These are some sculpture ideas. CV surgery, cardiovascular surgery can have a person going undergoing open heart surgery. And my artist friend, you know, put a handsaw there. I told him I wanted a circular rotating buzzsaw, but you get the idea. Um, I noticed that there's always seems to be a lot of men looking at the statue of the woman undergoing a speculum exam, but I never see any women watching the statue of the man undergoing cystoscopy. I have seen, there tends to be a few women standing around chatting when the man undergoes a wallet biopsy, very interesting. Okay, now there's been a lot of vegans who've been getting the word out, you know, trying to educate the public, the masses. And, you know, you got Chef AJ handling the cards here at this bout. And Dr. McDougal, Dr. McDougal is going head to head with Big Meat. And, you know, he's got the Notre Dame fighting Irish shorts on. Um, big Meat and Big Pharma, Big Food tend to go together. Okay. Um, so as far as the fairy tales, I've kind of myth, mixed in the fairy tales with the myths, just sort of whatever worked to make it go along. And, you know, a lot of them have a pretty straightforward uh, connection. So first of all, 
Humpty Dumpty, you know, was a bit of an arrogant fellow. And he said, when I use a word in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. And then Alice over here says, well, the question is whether or not you can make words mean so many different things. Humpty Dumpty says, the question is whether who is to be the master, that is all, <laughs> the word or him. So anyways, we know all that Humpty Dumpty fell. And so my point is, you want to get your act together with your diet and your health habits before you have an irreversible event, like a myocardial infarction or a stroke, okay? And there's an old quote, it's sort of anonymous, I don't know who made it. If you eat a low-fat vegan diet, you don't need a doctor. If you eat a sad diet, no doctor can save you. And it's an oversimplification, but it's pretty close to accurate. Um, so get your act together, the sooner the better. And Lewis Carroll has a lot of other good quotes. You know, for example, one of them from Through the Looking Gas is, the rule is jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. And I'm like, you know what? That reminds me uh, of my wife. Whenever I ask if we're going to do it, she seems to say that. Okay. <laughs> now, we, we can also learn a lot from studying other civilizations, epidemiology, and even studying some of the ancient civilizations. And this right here is a painting of the lost city of Atlantis, you know, related to ancient Greece. Kind of cool. They got the little mini sub coming in. Okay, so one of the first obvious fairy tales that applies is the ugly duckling. And so everyone can relate to this, you know, they're in their fat phase, looking like the Mona Lisa, and they want to look skinny like Venus, and we can help you with that. Okay, there is another um, old fairy tale story that's relevant. It's called Bird Ends Mule, or ASS is how it's also sometimes referred to as. The problem with the mule is the mule is equally hungry and equally thirsty, and he's placed equal distance between water and food. And because the mule can't make up his mind, he starves to death and dies. Okay. And what is the point of this? The point is that a lot of people want to lose weight, uh, but they don't want to give up the meat and the processed food. They can't commit and they don't do anything. Okay. Until then they have an irreversible event, whatever it might be, heart attack or stroke, and it's too late. And so this inability to commit is sort of a form of analysis paralysis. So a good thing to do is just try it for a couple months, try it for two months, three months, and I think what will happen is you'll see some results and that can motivate you to continue as we sort of spoke about later. Like Chef AJ said, eat veggies first to kind of stretch your stomach, get early satisfaction of hunger. And then for long-term satisfaction of hunger, starch is the best way. Mm -hmm. Eat low percentage fat, rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes, all have only 1% fat. The lower the fat, the skinnier the population. Look at uh, the Chinese, you know, before 1970, when they ate all rice, 1% fat or less, billion out, about 90, 85 to 90% of their calories, billion out of a billion are skinny except for Bolo in the Bruce Lee movies because he's taking steroids. Um, and by the way, if you want to eat beans that are low fat, lentils are probably the lowest fat at about 3% compared to like garbanzos or you know chickpeas are about uh, 13%. Uh, so do your OMAD diet. Uh, the only thing making it a little more complicated these days is we don't know what's going on with that eight pill coating on the fruits. So I'm eating a little more starch than I usually do. Um, I'm eating some frozen stuff. I don't think it's on there, but I'm in the process of getting that figured out. If you are taking any medications, especially for hypertension or diabetes or anticoagulation, let your doctor know so you can titrate the dosages. They'll probably decrease when you go this path. And I know what a lot of people do. A lot of people are like the young Icarus, Icarus and Daedalus. He's the father and that's the son, you know, let's say 20 years of age, around that age, about the age where young guys, testosterone so high, they never listen to anybody. And anyways, his father told him, don't fly too close to the sun. And the equivalent of that in nutrition speak is don't be tricked into this keto, paleo, low-carb carnivore cycle because they get an early loss of water weight and they're all happy, but then they crash and burn. Here's Icarus falling down into the water, okay? And here's a picture, too, of Icarus after he's crashed, you know, uh, from flying too close to the sun. His wind's melted in the story, but in our story, basically, they get constipated, burnout, and a yo-yo cycle, short-term weight loss followed by gain. It just doesn't tend to work. I liked also this painting from ancient Greece. This is Diogenes. He was sort of the homeless street philosopher. And he walked one day in the evening with his lantern and people say, what are you doing? Where are you going? He says, I'm searching for one honest man. So I'm kind of joking. I'm searching for one honest promoter of paleo, keto, carnivore diets. Because when I look at the science, I don't see it. All right. And now here's another ancient Greek man who had to fight off siren temptations. And this is Odysseus, and he has chained, he had himself tied to the mast so that he would not react to the sirens who were calling out to him. And all the men, if you look around, and they've got their ears and a hat and their ears strapped over so they won't hear the sirens and, and do things they shouldn't do. So I thought that was a rather nice painting. Don't be tempted by nonsense. And then here's another painting of the sirens, a little bit more like what I would expect sirens to look like. Um, 
again, the men had their head around. This is a different artist here. I thought it's kind of a beautiful painting. And another thing that Odysseus did, Odysseus, is, as you'll remember, after the Trojan War was over, Odysseus was trying to find his home, way home to Greece, to Attica. And it took him 10 years to find his way home. And he had all kinds of obstacles and difficulties along the way. And he didn't know what to do. He was lost. He's kind of in despair and hopeless. And it was recommended to him to go into the underworld. To go into the underworld is called catabasis. It's a literary form. And the advantage of that is you can learn from people in the past who are no longer with us. So he went and spoke to the great prophet Tiresias from Thebes, who gave him good advice that helped him figure out what he needed to do to find his way back home, find his way back to health. Okay, and what that means to us analogous is that we can look at our nutrition forefathers. We can read about Walter Kempner. There's a great biography of him. Um, I think the author's name is Barbara Newborg. It's quite good. I would recommend you read that book. If you want to learn about Kempner. Plus, there's lots of videos online about Walter Kempner. Um, you can read Dennis Burkett's books, and there's videos online about him. You can read Nathan Pritikin's book, and there's videos online about him. Uh, Roy Swank's book, and there's videos about him. So you learn a lot from our nutrition forefathers. One of the things I especially like about these guys, you'll see, they're just trying to figure out how everything works. There's no, there's no secondary trying to sell something. So, and also that was back in the days before you had all this big money coming in that's biased a lot of the research. So it's well worth your study, all, all of those individuals there to learn quite a lot of useful information about nutrition and health. Okay, speaking of old timers who had some interesting thoughts and experience with diet is Pythagoras. Everybody's heard of Pythagoras because they remember the Pythagorean theorem for figuring out an isosceles triangle, you know, the angles and stuff. But it actually turns out he was the first vegetarian, the first well-known vegetarian. Some people say it's because he believed in the transmigration of souls and that, you know, any animal could become a different type of animal. Other people say that's not really true and it was because of health. He certainly did promote the vegetarian diet thinking that it was a lot healthier. Um, and as a matter of fact, before 1840, the vegetarian diet was called the Pythagorean diet. It was only, they didn't coin these names vegetarian diet until around 1840. Uh, Pythagoras was kind of an all around interesting guy. There were people that were sort of his followers, the Pythagoreans. And, you know, he figured out the octave scale on, on the harp. They would celebrate the sunrise. So they enjoyed sunshine, they enjoy music, and they enjoyed a vegetarian diet. Those are major steps towards becoming quite healthy. And these things don't cost any money. All right, and now we're gonna get into another allegory coming from the ancient Greeks. This one is from Plato, and this is Plato's cave. So in Plato's cave, the majority of the citizens were essentially intellectually chained, if you will, within the cage. And they were simply shown shadows by the storytellers who controlled what they saw. And most people never turned around or ever thought of anything in a different way. They simply were just convinced by the shadows that they saw. The shadow makers were the paleo, keto, carnivore community, uh, getting them to try to believe all this nonsense, okay? So there was a fire behind them that reflected over the, the, the statues that were held up. Rarely, one of these persons would escape from the chains and find their way to climb up out of the cave. And when they first climbed up out of the cave, it was very difficult. The bright sunlight was overpowering. And they were now starting to recognize absolute truth instead of manufactured truth, if you will. And so the idea of it is that one should try to get up into the real light of truth. Um, at the same time, when a person does reach into the, the light of real truth and real experience, and they try to come back down in the cave, often they are not met with friendliness. The people in the cave say, you're crazy, you're nuts. You know, where are you going to get your protein? Where are you going to get your calcium? Vegans are all wimps. Okay, that sort of stuff. And it takes a while to go through that. And sometimes you might think it's not even worth it. But that is the allegory of the cave by Plato from Plato's Republic as it relates to nutrition and health. And it's a very useful metaphor. To me, it reminds me of the Indian metaphor of six blind men and an elephant, where the first guy holds the elephant's um, tail and says it's a rope. Second guy holds his leg, says it's a tree. The next one holds his ear, says it's a rug. And the point of that is, you want to try to look at things from multiple different viewpoints and see the different viewpoints. And once you've gotten that, then try to, in a sense, raise yourself up like standing on a hill to look down so you can see with the bird's eye view and figure out the objective truth of the situation. And I think when you do that with nutrition, what keeps on happening, you're like, gee, you know, people end up being low fat, low sodium vegan. Okay. Uh, it works. Okay. Now here's another one of the ancient Greek stories. This is the story of Antigone. Antigone was a wonderful lady. She was the daughter of Oedipus. And we all know the famous Oedipus. Okay. And she had two brothers. One was named was Polynices and the other brother was Ediocles. And there was a conflict over who was going to be the ruler of the city of Thebes. And 
the brothers ended up like in a civil conflict between each other. And then a new king was put in place named Creon. And Creon did not like Polynices and declared because he's fought against what he saw his, his interest. So he declared that Polynices should be left outdoors to be eaten by the vultures and the dogs and that he should not be allowed to have a burial. And Antigone said, I don't care what the king says. And she buried her brother anyways. The guards caught her doing this and she was arrested and brought before Creon. And Creon said, why did you do this? You disobeyed me. And Antigone said, there are laws of the gods that are timeless and they are above the laws of man. Okay, and, and Creon still declared that she'd be executed. It's a long, sad story, but it basically just ruined his entire kingdom. And so what I'm trying to say here is, you know, that's one of the reasons why I teach this low-fat vegan diet. I got friends who tell me I'm crazy. Why you even bother with stuff? There's no money in this vegan stuff. Why do you bother with that nonsense? Why don't you get a moonlighting job, make some real money? Okay, um, and I can also tell you, here's how I see it. You want to try to do good things because when you do good things, it kind of has like a ripple effect. Each person doing something good ripples out and affects other people and so on and so on. And so the world gets better for everybody if we behave that way. We all try to do what's right. OK, so so each person in their own individual setting influences the people around them and that influences more people. And it can lead to things being better for everybody or if they're not being that way, worse for everybody. OK, now here is the story of Little Red Riding Hood. And how is that like the healthcare system? Well, <clears throat> Little Red Riding Hood, she got a basket full of goodies from her mother to give to grandma, okay, her Little Red Riding Hood's grandmother. And she had to walk, you know, over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house. She went, <clears throat> and when she got there, the wolf had eaten grandma and was hiding in the bed with the cap on over the big ears, but she still kind of noticed. So Little Red Riding Hood said, oh, what big rooms you have for Doppler stethoscope and EKG. And the wolf said, the better to hear you with, my dear. Little Red. Oh, and what big machines you have. So this is like a person visiting a hospital. And what big machines you have for CAT scan and MRI. And the wolf, the better to see you with, my dear. Little Red. Oh, and what big rooms you have for blood labs and colonoscopy. The better to smell you with, my dear. Little Red. Oh, what a big pharmacy you have. And the wolf, the better to drug you and rip you off and finish you off, my dear. Okay, so what's the point of this? That the idea of having diagnostic tests can be very useful. Get your total cholesterol check, check your vitamin B12 level, check your serum ferritin. But one of the things people forget is that having a diagnostic test does not cure you. You cure yourself by doing all of the, the things that are free for health in general, okay? Get your sleep, get your exercise, manage your stress, okay? Eat a good diet, avoid toxins. So I, what I'm saying is everybody <clears throat> tends to like going for diagnostic tests. I see tons and tons of people. Every single hospital in the whole Western world has like a river of people lined up every morning waiting to go for diagnostic tests. But how many want to go vegan? About one in 10,000. Okay. So how is Pandora's box or what medical test is Pandora's box like? Well, first of all, here's a radiology joke for you. What is the definition of a healthy person? Someone who hasn't had a body CT yet. So body CT means a body CT of the chest, abdomen, or pelvis, and pelvis, all right? And the, and the reason why somebody's healthy until they have that is because almost always there's a whole bunch of incidental lomas. An incidental loma means you find something that's probably nothing, but it might be a small tumor, okay? And so then they get stuck in these workups and like a lung micronodule. We, we see those all the time. It's, it's probably at least 70% of people have some type of lung micronodule, okay, or nodule. Um, ectatic thoracic aorta, and then they're stuck in follow-ups for that. Thick esophageal wall, thyroid nodule, thoracic spine, bone lesion, liver low density lesion. Okay, liver possible enhancing lesion, a THAD, transient hepatic attenuation deficit, kidney lesion, atypical kidney cyst. Okay, nowadays too, they lower the radiation dose on CAT scans, meaning there's more scatter. And because there's more scatter, that means more noise. Cysts look noisy. So you can't tell a lot of times if it's really just a benign cyst, especially with a non-contrast scan. Got to get a follow-up, go for an ultrasound, go for an MRI. And a lot of times you go to some private practice hospital, the first screening CT will, might be free, but then all the follow-ups, you got to pay for them. And that could be a lot of money and a lot of time will worry, okay? And a lot of it really depends on your pretest probability. Okay, um, now Zeus, by the way, we're going to talk a little more about Prometheus. In our case, we're going to call him Plant Man Prometheus. But Prometheus was the Greek who stole fire from Zeus. Zeus was like the god of ancient Greece, the head boss guy, okay? And because he was mad at Prometheus, he played a trick on him. 
Prometheus had a brother. Prometheus means pro means before. Prometheus is thought. So this is pro thought, forethought, thinking in advance. Prometheus was very wise. His brother was a little bit slow, Epimetheus, and that means afterthought. So anyways, he sent a woman there, a beautiful woman named Pandora, and she brought with her a mysterious box. And she was highly curious, and she was not supposed to open it, but she could not control her curiosity. And once she opened it up, all kinds of things came out of there, all these problems for the world. And it's kind of funny in a sense, like the Bible, you know, sort of blames things on Eve. She's the one who eats and wait the apple. <laughs> the Greek stories kind of blame it on a woman too. She opened up Pandora's box. At the bottom of the box, though, there was something good. There was hope. Okay. So what am I trying to say is be careful about going for screening body CTs because yes, and if, if you have a problem, let's say you're symptomatic, abdominal pain or something like that, you can have a highly beneficial result from that CAT scan and it's good to get it, okay? But to just walk in for a screening C CT for the heck of it when you don't really have any significant symptoms, you're much more likely to find incidental omas, okay? You ask any radiologist, they deal with tons of these every day. When an internal medicine doctor sends a patient for a screening CT, they expect to get follow-ups from it. I've had one internal medicine doctor just say to me, the bane of her existence is doing these follow-ups. She says that's half of her time every day. Okay, um... Let's see. Okay, so there's some nice paintings. The other thing I say is the way I see a lot of these patients, I showed you that um, the little red riding hood of the wolf is they're kind of overwhelmed by the big size of the hospital, all the fancy technology and the machines. And they're like like a deer in the headlights, if you will. And so on the one hand, they're they're kind of intimidated by it and they will agree to almost anything, even if they can, they don't understand it. And the other thing is, some patients I've noticed, they sort of see going to a hospital as like this interesting adventure, you know? And what I'm trying to say is going, This is these are the pilgrims on their way to Canterbury. And what I'm saying is a hospital is no joke, okay? It's serious business. It could have a major effect on your health. So you don't want to be going there unless you have a good reason, okay? If you want to get a screening study, there's always doctors that are happy to scope you from below, happy to scope you from above, what I would do is I would try to lower my pretest probability. My mother died of colon cancer, so I did get a colonoscopy in the past. The gastroenterologist told me my colon was so normal it wasn't even funny. And what I do now is I just optimize my health habits to lower my risk. So my pretest probability of having a colon cancer or a polyp even is much lower than my risk of having a complication. So there's no point in me screening. And so I prefer not to screen. And another thing that's not widely realized is that you look at some of these cancer curves in Japan, for example, even though they smoke like chimneys, same thing in Papua New Guinea, they had much, much, much less um, lung cancer than Americans did. And I think the reason is because the Americans had a double risk factor. Not only the cigarette smoke, they were also eating the westernized diet, which you know, with all the high fat and the sodium is gonna cause tissue hypoxia. Tissue hypoxia greater than let's say 35% can induce the Warburg effect causing mitochondrial dysfunction because the mitochondria needs oxygen to make ATP. And when the mitochondria is injured, the cell can transform itself into functioning like an anaerobic bacteria, which is how cancer behaves, okay? Um, so that's the metabolic theory of cancer. And so what you want to do is minimize your risk factors to lower your risk of that, okay? And then and this is something I, I alluded to earlier that, you know, we know that the low-fat vegan is the way to avoid almost all the chronic diseases and live a good long life and probably have an average age of death 90 or older, Okay. Whereas if you go down the meat and oil processed food, you end up drug, 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 chop, chop, chop with surgery, bye-bye money, dead early, okay? But what I'm saying is avoid toxin. This is the big thing that up until recently, I think the vegan community has not been too aware of. And uh, pretty easy to learn toxins. You simply just have to start looking at them. Study estrogenic chemicals, study heavy metals, study preservatives, study excitotoxins, mitochondrial toxins, circuit toxins, okay? And that's kind of the big thing right there. There's, there's other stuff too, but that's the big idea. Okay, now I want to just briefly talk about what is it like to be a nutrition expert and how much feedback do we get? I said this before, if you're a good athlete, everybody likes you. The owner of the team likes the athletes. The coach likes the athletes, wants them to win. The teammates do, the fans do, but it's not like that in the health world. In the health world, if you're working in conventional health and you're doing this vegan lifestyle stuff, a lot of conventional health doesn't like it. And sort of like Zeus in the world of conventional medicine and big money is like big pharma, big food, okay? Big medicine, okay? And they don't like it when nutrition experts teach too many. Luckily, the pros don't tend to listen too much. So they never really have that much of effect. And so big pharma don't come after them too much. But when plant man Prometheus stole fire from Mount Olympus, Zeus was pissed off. He threw some lightning bolts at him. And then, you know, of course, Prometheus gave it to um, 
gave it to mankind to help him. One thing too, this is a painting. Zeus would often hide his identity and appear as something else. Like here he is as a bull and he abducted, seduced Europa. And kind of a beautiful painting here. And there's also the symbol of Zeus, the eagle. And I thought this was a little interesting because I'll show you what I learned that the planet Jupiter, Jupiter is the Roman or Latin name for Zeus, you know, it was the Greek name, Zeus. So anyways, Jupiter planet has four major moons named Io, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. And those were four of the uh, lovers of Zeus. So when NASA made a satellite to observe Jupiter, they named it Juno, which is the Roman name for Hera or Latin name for Hera, the Greek name. And because Hera was always chasing Zeus around, trying to find him when he was in his disguises, seducing women. So I thought that was kind of funny that Juno was the name of their space observation satellite for Jupiter, for Zeus. Anyways, um, here's a nice painting of Prometheus. Here's his punishment for helping mankind. This is the symbol of Zeus, the eagle, and of course the thunderbolt. He sends the eagle every day to eat the liver. The liver can regenerate, okay? So what am I basically saying? Be nice to your nutrition coaches and experts who help you because their life is rougher than you think. Okay, and luckily Hercules came along and he helped to save Prometheus. This is Prometheus bound. You know, Zeus had him shackled to the mountain by Hephaestus or the Vulcan who was the blacksmith for Zeus. And uh, anyways, Hercules helped protect him. So, you know, we need to have the ability to have free speech discussions about nutrition and toxicology so we can help each other to learn and help to optimize our health. Okay, I'm briefly going to talk just a little bit here about an action potential in a neuron. So this is a neuron, like a cell in your brain. Here is the cell body where the nucleus is located that has the DNA in it. Here's the mitochondria. This is the axon. And an electrical message is transmitted from the cell body down to the axon terminal. And, you know, sodium generates a current. And once you reach the, ac reach the axon terminal, after an action potential has come into the terminal... Uh, calcium flows into the axon terminal through a calcium channel, and the increase in cytoplasm calcium activates these neurotransmitter, N NT is for neurotransmitter, these vesicles to travel to the plasma membrane at the synapse. The synapse is the connection between two neurons. Release the neurotransmitter, it diffuses across the cleft, exerts an effect upon the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, that's how a neuron works. And the key point is calcium is the ion that makes it happen. Think of calcium, you know, remember the ring is one ring to rule them all, one ion to rule them all. Once calcium goes up in the cytoplasm, things happen. Whatever that cell does, whatever is its big trick is, that happens. So in a neuron, that means to release neurotransmitter. Okay, here's pretty much how a cell does its business. I'm going through this uh, physiology here because it's gonna enable you to understand tons of things about human health. This is really valuable physiology I'm sharing with you. Okay, it explains a whole bunch of diseases. All right, so every cell has what's called a KNATPS. K is for uh, for potassium. It's it comes from the Latin word kalium, kale, like kale, potassium, kalium, and N is for natrium, the Latin word for sodium. All right, so I put the first letter K because it is the potassium coming into the cell, and I put the second letter N because the natrium, the sodium, is going out of the cell. Notice that two K are pumped in, three Na are pumped out. So we're pumping out more positive charge. Sodium is plus one and as is potassium, plus one charge on it. So they're both cations, meaning positively charged ions. The relevance is the cell develops a negative char negatively charged interior over time. And having a differential charge across a membrane, that's a battery. And the cell uses that for energy. The cell does most of its work across the plasma membrane based on this gradient, okay? There's a gradient that's electrical in terms of negative 65 millivolts is the charge differential. And it's also a chemical gradient. There's much more sodium outside the cell than there is inside the cell, electrochemical gradient. And that is then coupled to doing other things. By allowing sodium to come in along its gradient, you can pump out calcium. And this is the NACA exchanger, Na for sodium, Ca for calcium. It's often abbreviated NCX. And this thing is super fast, can pump out thousands of calciums per second. So neurons have a lot of these. By the way, in a neuron, 65, 66% of the neuron's energy runs this K and ATPase. It is the most important energetic thing in the entire cell. So that's a lot. Two thirds of the neuron's energy go to this. In a regular cell, it's more like about one third of its energy. But this is super important. So as you can imagine, uh, it's a big deal to eat too much dietary sodium. You're messing up this ion pump in all your cells. Okay, it's also a big deal to eat too much calcium. You don't want to be doing that because you could interfere with this. Plus, there's a lot of things that affect calcium metabolism. All right, and like I said, when calcium comes up high in the cell, that's when things happen, like release of a neurotransmitter. 
all right, in your neurons, in a smooth muscle cell that line your arteries, smooth muscle cell contraction, release of insulin. So when you have problems with this, you can cause insulin resistance. I'm gonna get to that in a moment, but there's also a very high concentration, like sodium, there's a high concentration of calcium outside the cell compared to inside the cell. And that coupled electrochemical gradient is used to do pump all kinds of other things across that plasma membrane. All right, so the big new thing I'm gonna share with you today is something called Circa. Circa is right here. In a skeletal muscle, the calcium storage organelle is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's what the S is for. In most other cells, it's simply called ER for endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and then the CA stands for calcium ATPase. So it's an ATP driven pump. Here's the ATP. And what it does is it pumps calcium from the cytoplasm into the endoplasmic reticulum. So the endoplasmic reticulum is like a, a storage site for calcium. It's in continuity with the nucleus. That's why it's drawn this way. All right, so the relevance is when calcium comes into the cell and its concentration increases in the cytoplasm, big things happen. It is the major controller of cell function. In a neuron, release of neurotransmitter, like glutamate, for example, excitatory neurotransmitter. In the pineal gland of the brain, that's where melatonin is made. Melatonin is then released, which helps you to sleep. Okay, in the mast cells, which are a major cell in your immune system, the mast cell will degranulate, meaning that it will release vesicles of histamine, which is quite inflammatory, okay? So persons who have a problem with calcium metabolism will be more prone to allergies, for example, or abnormal hyperinflammatory immune responses. In the pancreas, increased cytoplasm calcium will cause the release of insulin, okay? In the skeletal muscle, it'll cause the muscle to contract, cause the heart muscle to beat, you know, for timing, like a pacemaker effect, and it'll also cause heart muscle to contract. And it'll also cause the, the smooth muscle cells lining the arteries to contract. So if you have chronic high cytoplasm calcium, your arteries are going to be con contracted and that's going to cause hypertension. It also causes platelet activation. It makes the platelets more prone to clotting. So that is bad. So the point of all this is that it's a big deal what's happening with cytoplasm calcium and we want it to be optimized. And the way we optimize it is Plant-based diet gives us lots of potassium. It's a long story, but magnesium is relevant to this too because magnesium is always a cofactor on ATP because it keeps those phosphates with their powerful negative charges from busting apart and its positive charge sort of gets the negative charge of the phosphate to calm down. So ATP only does what it's supposed to. Um, and then you need this circa because what happens is after a neuron, let's say an action potential is fired, neurotransmitter is released, the neuron then needs to shut that down. So real quick, calcium is pumped back into the endoplasmic reticulum of a neuron, okay? In a vascular smooth muscle cell, same thing. Once you contract it as much as you need to, you want to relax. Same thing in a skeletal muscle. So you got to quickly pump that calcium into this endoplasmic reticulum. And that's what Circa does. So you need a good Circa in order to be able to lower cytoplasm calcium. That is super important. I'm, I'm just sharing with you. That is super important. You have to know that. Circa pumps calcium out of the cytoplasm into the endoplasmic reticulum to lower it down and to turn things off, okay? High calcium in the cytoplasm is like a green traffic light, turns things on, go, 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 okay? Pumping calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum is shuts things off, red light, okay? Also, you've got these other pumps. You've got the NACA exchanger, which is, you know, the sodium calcium exchanger, and that pumps a ton of calcium out into the extracellular matrix, pumps it outside the cell. Okay. You also have another pump down here called the plasma membrane calcium ATPase. It is especially relevant in non-neuronal cells, non-excitable cells. So in smaller amounts, it, it has a relatively high affinity for calcium and it, it'll pump out calcium for numerous situations. Okay. But when you have a cell that's really doing big things with calcium, like your excitable cells, cardiac muscle, uh, neurons, et cetera, you're going to be using NACA more and you're going to need circa more. Okay. All right, so why is that such a big deal? Because there's tons of things that lower circa function. All of your halogens tend to be toxic to it, uh, less so iodine, but take a look at this, bromine, which is a typical component of flame retardants. So if you look at the surgical gowns, the blue gowns, for example, I know we got a lot of healthcare professionals here. The blue gowns are going to have flame retardants in them because you're working with cautery. They're afraid there's going to be a fire, so they have flame retardant. Versus you can just use like something, if you just need a splash protector, you're doing some other procedure that doesn't require full sterile scrub, then just wear, you know, one of those yellow or white gowns so you don't have to have flame retardants on there, okay? Um, titanium dioxide nanoparticles are a common thing now in sunscreens and in medications. They're like a whitener for pills and stuff. They're toxic to mitochondria and they're toxic to the testes. And I think they have a harmful effect on circa as well. Yeah, they're a mitochondrial inhibitor. They affect succinate dehydrogenase, okay? 
um, neurotoxic, neurotoxicological effects of titanium dioxide nanoparticles. So what, how is this relevant? Well, I wouldn't be taking any pill or rubbing any cream on myself with this stuff, okay? You can have titanium dioxide that's not a nanoparticle in some type of sunscreen. I actually avoid sunscreens, but I mean, some people have to work outdoors and need them, but avoid these nanoparticles because they can be quite toxic to you. And these are showing that they tend to damage the plasma membrane calcium ATPs. That's a slower one, but it's still important that I was talking about and they will cause neurotoxic effects and cause impaired uh, cognitive function, impaired spatial recognition, okay? Not good. And like I said, you see these in lots of cosmetic products, sunscreens, they're also in toothpaste and cosmetics. So you, my advice is just be a minimalist. It's so hard to know what to avoid. I would say just avoid as much things as you can. And then the things you have to use, check them out pretty carefully. So here was a little bit about how oxidative stress, and that can be caused, let's say, by having a high serum ferritin, for example, by eating a lot of omega-6 fats. Uh, oxidative stress in the blood will have a tendency to damage the uh, plasma membrane calcium ATPase. Okay, it, for whatever the reason, it just has uh, a common pattern that it'll damage that, and that will start to damage calcium metabolism in your cell. So you want to avoid things that cause oxidative stress. As a general principle, if you hear something causes oxidative stress, think that it might damage plasma membrane calcium ATPase, and avoid it if you can. Okay, and what's an example of why that matters? Well, it is thought that injury to the plasma membrane calcium ATPase is a major contributor to the pineal gland in the brain becoming calcified. Uh, F minus in the water is also thought to do that. Okay, so you want to avoid those things because there's a more, and I look at I look at head CTs all the time, every day, and I can tell you, I see more than half of them in people over 60, their pineal glands are calcified, which means that they're making less melatonin which is going to make it more difficult for a person to sleep. Okay. So one of the things you do to sleep better is get rid of caffeine. Stop, stop the caffeine. You don't need it. Great. You can taper it off, but that's one thing you can do. Avoid anything that's a stimulant, you know, tobacco. Um, and there's other things that could potentially do too. You want to avoid that stuff. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about something again, related to circa is that diabetes is associated with glycation of that circa, you know, the calcium pump into the endoplasmic reticulum. And Decreased circa function is associated with worsening of diabetes. They're a vicious circle, okay? And uh, there's a lot of papers on this stuff. Again, here's the vicious circle. So if you have decreased circa function, you're going to have more insulin resistance. More insulin resistant means worsening diabetes, which causes more increased blood glucose level, hyperglycemia, and that will cause glycation of circas. And you'll also get elevated hemoglobin A1C, which is glycating your hemoglobin. And that's why the higher your hemoglobin A1C, likely the worse uh, circa function you have in your body. So in general, what do you want to do? You want to stop, avoid the things that cause insulin resistance, like, you know, high fat diets, especially saturated fat, um, excessive uh, dietary sodium, deficiency of potassium and magnesium. So just eat the plant-based diet, okay? Low-fat plant-based diet, and you avoid the major causes of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. And then avoid all these things that cause circa. I'm going to give a list here in just a little bit. And you you want to break out of this vicious cycle. This is, it's real common. Most Americans are sort of trapped in this, and they just progressively deteriorate. Okay, nitric oxide also plays a role that it improves circa function. Okay, so, and you would think they might be related because they both affect calcium metabolism and the amount of cytoplasm calcium because nitric oxide is a vasodilator and it also prevents platelet aggregation. So what did we just say? High cytoplasm calcium causes vasoconstriction and causes platelet activation. So nitric oxide is your friend, you know? So just like uh, Dr. Esselstyn is always talking about, do what you can to increase nitric oxide. Yeah, you want to do that. And not only that, the better control cytoplasm calcium, you'll, you'll tend to have better circa function, okay? They work together. So there's things that help you and there's things that make that, that make you healthier and things that make you sicker. So you want to avoid things that lower nitric oxide, like excess dietary sat fat, excess um, dietary sodium. All right. Um, and now here's something else that's interesting, that there's decreased circa function with lung cancer especially small cell lung cancer and adenocarcinoma of the lung. Adenocarcinoma of the lung has become quite common, okay? It wasn't shown to be the case with squamous cell or large cell, but it's a major player in uh, these two cancers, small cell and adenocarcinoma of the lung. So what I'm saying is circa and um, calcium metabolism, sodium metabolism, potassium metabolism, they're important in every single cell in your body. And that's that whole idea of if your whole body is healthy, then you're less likely to have these problems, okay? So I think that's relevant. Um, normal electron transport. Now, what I talked about was the issue of circa. Uh, in the past, I've talked about excitotoxicity. Now I'm going to talk about mitochondrial toxicity. 
And one of the reasons why I'm talking about them all together here is they're all connected. They all kind of can cause each other. And so you want to just avoid all of them as much as you can. And, you know, to some extent, there's some things, no matter what you do, there's some things you can't completely avoid, but avoid what you can. And the net result is I think you'd be a lot healthier. All right. So here is a mitochondrial membrane. There's an outer mitochondrial membrane, abbreviated OMM. And here's the inner mitochondrial membrane, usually abbreviated IMM. Okay. And there are these protein uh, complexes. This is complex one, complex two, three, and four. All right, and they're like a fireman bucket brigade and they pass electrons from the least electron grabber to the most powerful electron grabber. The ultimate electron acceptor is oxygen. Oxygen has like the highest electronegativity other than fluoride for wanting to grab electrons. So you pass, it's almost like a, like a snowball rolling downhill, okay? Till it gets to oxygen, then the oxygen is converted into water, all right? All right, so what I'm saying is there's a lot of things that will inhibit this. I'll show you these on the next slide. And you want to, minimize inhibition of your electron transport because you need this to make ATP. The vast majority of energy in your body is made from electron transport. You know, in the ballpark of 85% or something, it depends on the exact cell type and whatnot, but it's most of your energy in your body. The brain makes tons and tons of ATP in this way. So what happens is these complexes pump a proton into the intramembranous space between the outer and the inner membrane. And it's like, it's like pressurized air, if you will. Okay, all these protons pumped in there. And then they harvest the gradient at this next complex here, sometimes called complex five, and when that comes in, this is ATP synthase, this pump right here. And it will then spin and it converts ADP plus phosphate into ATP. And this is adenosine triphosphate. And that then is used by the rest of the cell for energy. That's like a $20 bill in a cell, okay? Um, so you have to make this gradient. You have to pump protons and the proton gradient has to be harvested. That is how energy is made in all animals. All right, so... What is the effect of some of these uh, mitochondrial toxins? These food dyes. One of the reasons why I won't ever eat a processed food, um, you know, things that have more than one ingredient is because these food dyes, there's a whole bunch of them. They inhibit mitochondria, all right? Um, and a lot of things you wouldn't even really think about it, but all these fungal inhibitors, most of them, the commonly used fungal inhibitors, they inhibit electron transport. They're inhibiting succinic dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase which is complex too. And it's very unique in the sense that it's both um, a participant in Krebs cycle, an enzyme of Krebs cycle, as well as an electron transporter in electron transport on the inner mitochondrial membrane for oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so fungicides inhibit mitochondria. So here's a crazy slide. I collect mitochondrial inhibitors. I've kind of been interested in them. So I've, I'm collecting like the ones that are clinically relevant to us. And as you can see here, fat is like the big one. Fat, um, especially saturated fat, tends to inhibit when it's present in excessive amounts, complex three. And it'll actually cause electron transport to reverse, and that causes insulin resistance. And the best discussion of that is in the Michael Brownlee paper that I alluded to earlier, Unifying Theory of Diabetes Complications. Okay, but then it turns out there's a whole bunch of other things that do it. For example, Hg, mercury. And that has a tendency sometimes to get into high fructose corn syrup, which is the reason why I'll never eat anything with high fructose corn syrup. Okay, um, F- minus inhibits complex four. That's why I, I won't drink water with F- minus in it, Okay. Um, lead is sometimes a contaminant in a few things that'll inhibit this pathway. Omega-6 oils have a tendency to be converted partly into toxic aldehydes like hydroxynonanol, HNE, that inhibits um, ATP synthase over here. Uh, cadmium is on automobile brake pads, and that's why I won't sit at a sidewalk cafe when that's on a busy street because I don't want to, you know, get that into my, breathe that stuff in, okay? Atrazine, which is commonly sprayed on uh, GMO non-organic corn, so I won't eat that stuff. That's a very powerful estrogenic chemical. Plus it's a mitochondrial inhibitor. You see how all this stuff can add up? All right. Um, can you see my hands right now? Are you able to see my hands? Okay. Well, I, I was gonna... Yes, yes, yes. I can see your hands. Oh, okay. So I'm going to show you, this is actually the Peter Rogers theory of neurovascular uncoupling. You have a neuron in your brain and it has a baseline level of work that it needs to do. That's its metabolic rate. And it has a baseline level of oxygen and glucose. So this is called neurovascular coupling, that the oxygen and glucose delivery to the brain cell has to be matched and even. And so if you take a stimulant like caffeine or tobacco um, or, you know, methylphenidate, you know, for ADHD, you are increasing the metabolic activity of that neuron. Or if you're stressed out, all these things increase glutamate across the synapse, excitatory neurotransmitter, and you're going to increase the metabolic rate of that neuron. All right. Now, if you simultaneously eat a meal that's quite high in fat, you drop the oxygen delivery, let's say about 15, 20%. So now you're going to have a bigger gap between the metabolic need of that neuron and its oxygen and glucose delivery. All right. 
Well, if you eat a lot of sodium in that meal, you vasoconstrict, you tighten up that artery. So you're going to, you're going to widen this gap. Then the more of these mitochondrial inhibitors you're exposed to, the more you're dropping the energy production. So you're widening the gap between the metabolic need of that neuron to do its job to function and also to stay alive and what it can actually produce amount of energy. So the bigger this gap between oxygen glucose delivery, which also really means oxygen energy production level and the metabolic needs of that neuron, the more likely it's gonna go screw it and it's just gonna die. When a neuron cannot meet its metabolic demands that are placed upon it, it will slowly go into what's called apoptosis. Apoptosis is also called programmed cell death. It's a gradual death whereby the cell recycles itself. So its chemical constituents can be you know, absorbed by a macrophage and sent to other cells to be used. So it's a way the body, because lots of cells undergo apoptosis all over the body for good reasons in other locations, but you don't want that randomly happening to your brain cells. So what I'm saying is all of these things are dropping your energy level, your energy production ability. So you want to avoid this stuff as best you can. And so many people, what's happening is they're having their brain cells be uh, damaged by not one, but more like 10 or more things inhibiting their mitochondria, inhibiting their circa, okay? Causing increased metabolic activity, the stimulants, the caffeine, the MSG, the tobacco, okay? It's all bad, okay? The glyphosate often sprayed on non-organic GMO soy. That's also an excitotoxin, okay? Um, so <clears throat> I tell you all this because you want to learn these things and just avoid them all. Once you know them, it's easy to avoid them. Okay. And the way I would, you know, metaphorically say it is imagine you're walking down the street and a car's coming towards you, oops, and you jump out of the way. But if the car is invisible, how do you get out of the way? Well, the way you, you make the car not invisible is you have to know what it is. And, you know, it's pretty easy to look at the list and say, okay, I'll avoid it. And let's give me some other examples. Like trichloroethylene, also carbon tetrachloride are chemicals routinely used for dry cleaning. So I don't take my clothes to dry clean anymore. I find I don't need to. Okay, what do I do? If you're working on an oil rig, you're getting oil all over yourself, you know, and you're a big mess. Yeah, you're going to have to wash your clothes, you know, in some industrial way. Okay, typical person, what do you do? You go to work, you know, you push, you're a pencil pusher, you know, you may sweat your armpits a little bit. Whoop, you do. I don't even use laundry detergent. I just put it in water, rinse it off a little. That's fine. That's good enough. Okay. You don't need to be taking stuff to the dry cleaner. All right. And I would never work at a dry cleaner. They're exposed to so many toxic chemicals. They're very high incidence of brain damage, cognitive impairment, Parkinson's disease, et cetera. You don't want these mitochondrial inhibitors. Mitochondrial inhibitors are thought to also contribute to accelerated aging, Parkinson's disease, dementia. They're not good. Okay. Um, what are some other things you can avoid? Here are these antifungals, like I was just talking about, titanium dioxide nanoparticles. They inhibit uh, complex two, which is both part of Krebs cycle in the mitochondrial matrix. And it's also part of electron transport and the inner mitochondrial membrane. So I would not put anything on myself. That's got that stuff in it. I don't even use sunscreen. If I want to, if I want sunshine, I just go out, stand in front of my house or my yard, get about 30 minutes of, of sun, go back inside. Okay. Depending on how hot it is. I'll read a book out there for a little while. I don't need to go out the beach and rub all this sunscreen stuff on myself. Okay. If you have to work outdoors, I've seen the lawnmower guys. What do they do? They got a big sombrero on and they got a long sleeve shirt on. Okay. And you know, that seems to work pretty well for them. So you have to figure it out. Look at the statin medications. They will lower um, the function of coenzyme Q. All right. Like for example, a lot of people think, oh, I got some pain. I got a headache. I got to take a Tylenol. I wouldn't do it. It's a mitochondrial inhibitor. I wouldn't take it. A lot of people say, hey, you want to learn how welding? No, I don't want to learn welding. Not because I think it's a valuable skill, but I just don't want to be exposed to the fumes. Okay. Um, that's why I'm careful about how much iron I eat because excess of iron within the mitochondrial matrix here, it can contribute to running the Fenton reaction and the Fenton reaction, um, can lead to production of hydroxyl radicals and damage the mitochondrial inner mitochondrial membrane. All these food dyes, not all of them, but a lot of them are, are toxic to the mitochondria. So I won't eat any processed food that's got a dye in it. And if you have to take a medication, try to see if you can take a version of a medication that's less likely to have titanium dioxide nanoparticles in it, or to have food dyes used to color the outer surface of the pill. All right, so um, some of these anti-seizure medicines, what do anti-seizure medicines do? They slow down the brain. Well, I don't want my brain to be fat. Um, a lot of these antibiotics, you look at the antibiotic and the mechanism is gonna be inhibits mitochondrial function. Because remember, a mitochondria is kind of like a bacteria. It's thought the symbiotic theory of mitochondria that an ancient cell ingested a mitochondria and then the mitochondria and, and it became symbiotic working together. Okay, so what's my point? Anything that kills a bacteria, it might be harmful to you. It probably is. So I would not take an antibiotic unless I absolutely needed to. And watch out for these fluoroquinolones because the quinolones themselves are mitochondrial toxic. F minus is a mitochondrial toxin. 
And the typical antibiotic is a fluoroquinolone. Fluoride tends to have a really tight bond and it helps things get across uh, tight barriers like the blood brain barrier, also like the blood testicle barrier. So it's probably toxic to the testes. I haven't studied that yet, but I would be a little worried about it. I wouldn't take it unless I had to. And if I had to take antibiotics for something, I would say, what is the, what is the list on the chart? Because usually there would be one, two or three options for the most effective antibiotic. And I would take whichever one I thought was least likely to have a negative effect on my brain. If I've had to go for a medical procedure, like when I went for my colonoscopy many years ago, I refuse sedation, okay? And everybody in my family and my friends made fun of me. I said, I don't care. I don't want to be exposed to those drugs, like a benzodiazepine, something that blocks your memory. What if it never, my, mem my ne memory never comes back to what it was before? I'm not taking that drug. I'm mentally tough. whoop de do. Okay, so anyways, all right, here's a little story. This is the little Dutch boy. He was walking down next to the, the dike, the big wall against the water, you know, that protects Holland so it doesn't get flooded. And he saw that there was a little leak and no one was around and he's afraid it was going to get bigger. So he stuck his finger in the hole to prevent the leak from expanding. Okay. And he kept there all night until the builders came by the next day and then they patched up the leak. Okay. And so what I'm trying to say is, what does this remind me of in the nutrition world? It reminds me of, it's so obvious. All you got to do is look at an epidemiology textbook or video. Everybody in the plant area, they're skinny with no diabetes or hypertension. Everybody in the meat and processed food area, they're all a bunch of fat cells, okay? So it's obvious. So I see all this accumulating evidence reminding me of the of the water coming at the dike and it's about to break the dike open. And you figure, you know, a couple of years from now, everybody's gonna be a vegan. And just at the last minute, they're starting to patch the, the nutrition hole. They got all these people on the internet promoting Mediterranean paleo keto carnivore and they're patching the dike with this new, you know, AP, EEL coating that's plugging it up and it's going to make plant foods, especially fruits. And because I know it's on avocados and apples, a lot of different apple types, and they're talking about putting on a bunch of other things and it's going to make the fruits as unhealthy as everything else. So it's going to make it harder to demonstrate a benefit from the plant-based diet and in, in actuality. So I'm sad about that. So just do the best you can. When I get more information, I'll let you know, but it's, it's hard to, to actually learn about that, exactly what it's on and what it's not on. That would be valuable to know that. Uh, so anyways, that was what that reminded me of. Okay, what about Snow White and the Seven Dwarves? What does that have to do with health? Now, there's some controversies about Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Officially, the Brothers Grimm are listed as the authors, but you know, that, I think that's a lie. I think it's obvious because how can you tell? I think it's obvious that it was written by a woman and it was probably written by Snow White herself because she's perfect, okay? And then the dwarves represent the annoying habits of her husbands and husbands and boyfriends, sleepy, sneezy, grumpy, dopey. And really, you know, Snow White used to be fat and she was dating the doc who coached her to weight loss. And after she went vegan and lost all the excess weight, she dumped the doc and she ran off with the prince. And then she added in the wicked stepmother queen to make herself look good. So that's what I think really happened, okay? And uh, kind of reminded me of this painting here, Pygmalion and Galatea. So he had the statue and he fell in love with the statue and he thought she would come to life and then she ran off on him. All right, well, anyways, um, from a health standpoint, uh, you lose your 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 body, excess body weight and a lot of your nagging health problems like the nagging dwarves. By the way, there was a the 1937 version of this was great. I thought it was a great, and I love the singer. Uh, the lady was Adrian Casalotti, and the man was Harry Stockwell. If you listen to that song, you can find the internet in five seconds on YouTube, for example. The wishing song is beautiful. And that reminded me of another song. One of the best all-time love songs is Sweet Mystery of Life, and that is by Nelson Eddy and Jeanette McDonald. Trust me, if you look that up and you get the good version of it and you hear him singing, it's absolutely I know beautiful. that song. My father used to love it. Oh, sweet mystery of life at last I found you. Yep. My parents too. They, they loved it. And I love it too. It, it's just beautiful. It's great. It's true love there in music. Um, okay. Here's some things associated with decreased circle levels. Um, obesity. In general, the, the fatter the person, the higher the body mass index, BMI, the lower the circle level, uh, circle function. Okay. The worse sleep apnea, the worse circus functioning. It's almost like a barometer of health. Okay, the more hyperlipidemia, the higher the LDL, the lower the circle function. Okay, and it has been said, you know, Dr. Ornish and Dr. Esselstyn, that if a person follows a low fat vegan diet in, in general, even though some people have a higher set point, it seems, and they're eating 100% plant foods, some will still get a little bit higher atherosclerosis LDL level, but they have good outcomes long term, has been their experience. 
uh, even if they don't get their cholesterol as low as they want. Usually that means a total cholesterol below 150. That's what Esselstyn used in his studies. And that tends to be kind of agreed upon. Also coming from the Framingham study, the persons who kept their total cholesterol below 150 had much better long-term cardiovascular outcomes. Um, and diabetes in general, again, same type of correlation. The higher the hemoglobin A1C, um, the, the more likely they had a uh, poor circa function because they go together because circa gets glycated and that makes it dysfunctional. They also had more risk of cognitive impairment, neuronal cell death. Um, diabetic, type 2 diabetics in general have really low circa function levels. Um, that's a big concern. Like I said, too, it's been my experience. A lot of diabetics that I talk to, <laughs> pretty much most of them over 60 that have diabetes, they're, they're not functioning that great cognitively. They're not necessarily demented, but they're certainly cognitive slow. And my internal medicine friends say almost all of their patients over 60 are, are cognitively slow. Okay. Versus you, you look at somebody who's a low fat vegan without diabetes, they're still mentally sharp. Okay. Um, heavy metals. Um, most of these cause decreased circa function, you know, lead, you got to be careful what you be careful, you know, know what you're eating that it's not contaminated with lead. Okay. Uh, mercury can contaminate high fructose corn syrup. Like we talked about aluminum can get into a lot of things. That's sort of a topic. That's a big topic. There's, there's a whole good book on that. The Christopher Exley book, uh, imagine yourself in aluminum. That is a, that's a good book. Um, so anyways, you know, I think part of why the reason why Rome fell was they started using all lead pipes for their plumbing, um, and the plumbing that Rome had, and that caused cognitive impairment in the aristocrats, um, coal burning electric plants pump aluminum into the air. Um, a lot of paints will have aluminum in them. So you want to avoid that. Oh, that's lead. We'll have lead in them. Coal burning electric plants have lead in them. Sorry. That's what I meant to say. I actually color coded these. So PB is in bold black print right here. Uh, mercury because uh, is in yellow right here and aluminum is sort of in this silverish looking stuff aluminum looking stuff anyways um, food preservatives again you want to avoid processed foods because they got to keep stuff on the shelf otherwise if it gets returned to them they lose money so lots of preservatives bha bht tbhq they're associated with decreased circle function okay even some of these breads just the something called potassium bromate remember that's a halogen um, it's also toxic to circa a lot of food dyes well red number three in particular is toxic to circa. Um, grilling meat, you don't want to be doing that. I won't even be in the kitchen if somebody's cooking meat. And if they're grilling meat outside, I don't want to be around. Uh, things that give off VOCs, volatile organic compounds, as they transition from liquid to solid, often have a toxic effect on circa, like paints, glues, and adhesives. So if somebody's using that stuff, they should ventilate the area as well as possible. And if you don't have to be in that area, get away from that area. I don't like anything that stinks. You know, Your nose is given to you for a reason and you should pay attention to it air fresheners, you don't need them. I had to avoid that stuff. Okay. I had a relative who was sick and having asthma symptoms. And, you know, I sort of examined their house. They had a whole bunch of candles. They were lighting candles and all over the place. There's a lot of toxic things sometimes in these candles. I wouldn't be doing that. Okay. They stopped doing the candles and their health improved. Um, it's good to have a HEPA filter in your house. Um, a lot of halogens, you know, have a negative effect on circle. We talked about F minus from your tap water, the CL minus from tap, uh, from tap water also, you know, you need that as a disinfectant sanitizer until it gets to your house, but you don't need it. That's another reason why even though a lot of people think, oh, swimming is the greatest exercise. I don't think so because you're probably swimming in water with F minus and a lot of chlorine. I don't like that. Um, PCBs, uh, they're estrogenic. The nonstick coatings on cookware, I would avoid all these nonstick coatings. I think they're toxic because that's POFAS. Um, I would, I would avoid that stuff. You can get Instapots that are just stainless steel. That's like a pressure cooker. So it doesn't have nonstick type uh, coating and you avoid the problems with that stuff, which is like a polymer or a fluoride. Um, some of the dental floss will be lined with uh, Teflon, which is really like lining it with a form of a polymer of a fluoride like material. You want to avoid that. I get the simple unwaxed ones. Um, because they can leach F minus into the food and other related chemicals. Flame retardants, you want to avoid them when you can. Like I said, I avoid dry cleaning because of these chemicals. Um, I, I try not to work with stain removers or disinfectants if I can. If I have to work with some chemical that's a powerful chemical like that, open the window, get a fan, avoid inhaling it as best you can. Okay. For aluminum, you know, for example, you talk about aluminum. How do you get exposed to aluminum? Well, if you put aluminum foil in contact with your food, that's an exposure. If you um, have a deodorant, that's a spray on, that's the worst. If you could smell it, that means it's getting into your olfactory nerve, the, the cranial nerve of smell. And that also means that it has the highway right up to your brain, okay? 
Um, you don't want to be smelling aluminum. You don't want to be inhaling aluminum, okay? It's another reason why I think having an air filter at home is worth it, too, for that reason. Excess psychological stress tends to decrease circa. Uh, recreational drugs are all bad for circa. Alcohol, tobacco, MJ, cocaine, they're all bad for circa. Um, they also, not only are they bad for the circa function in your brain, they tend to be bad for circa in your gonads. Uh, MJ in particular was bad for that. I don't like it. Alcohol is just a direct neurotoxin. It's a poison. I recommend zero alcohol, zero tobacco, zero MJ. Okay, and of course, zero of this. Um, a lot of estrogenic chemicals as a side effect, they can decrease circa function like BPA and for hard plastics, uh, nonalphenol, like as, uh, in, you know, detergents. It's another reason you don't need a dishwasher detergent. If you're not cooking with oil, at least I don't, and you don't need, uh, you don't, even though the ladies in my house, they use it just cause out of habit and they cook for themselves with oil. Um, you don't need laundry detergent if you're just, you know, sweat a little bit in your clothes, just rinse them off. You don't need that stuff because liquid laundry detergent, you're, you're going to get three estrogenics. You can get BPA from the hard plastic of the bottle. You're going to get phthalate estrogenics from the conditioner to soften and mold the plastic. And then you're going to get the laundry detergent itself, something like nonalphenol. So that's three estrogenics on your, uh, on your clothing that's in contact with your skin all the time, transdermally absorbed, like dissolves like they're both lipids. Nanoparticles, avoid nanoparticles like titanium dioxide and sunscreens. I talked about this earlier. Zinc oxide nanoparticles common in sunscreens, for example, plus oxybenzone, another common chemical in sunscreens is a uh, estrogenic. Uh, pesticides and herbicides, that's one of the reasons why I prefer to eat organic. Um, and there's other ones. Anyway, so that just gives you an idea of some of the things you can avoid to avoid circa. And we talked about it. It increases the risk. Things that lower circa function increase your risk of uh, diabetes, Um and diabetes become irreversible because they'll cause endoplasmic reticulum stress, whereby uh, we don't need to get into all the details of that, but the management of insulin doesn't work so effectively. Um, increase your risk of heart failure. They increase your risk of atrial fibrillation and worrying of it and worsening of atrial fibrillation. Okay. They predispose you to being hypertensive. Um, they make your clot, your platelets more prone to clotting. This is all bad. This is all stuff. Things that plug up arteries are bad. Okay. Things that narrow arteries are bad because they make you more hypertensive. They cause myotherosclerosis. Plug up an artery in the brain, you got a stroke. Plug up an artery in the heart, you got a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. Um, not being able to regulate your intracytoplasmic calcium because your circuit's not working, it makes you weaker too because the muscle has to constantly be raising and lowering its cytoplasm calcium. So those circuit pumps have to work well if you're going to be optimal fitness and strength and endurance. Uh, they increase your risk of cataract as well, circuit dysfunction. Increase your risk of allergies because your excessive mast cell degranulation. And they also decrease effective function in the immune system. So they increase your risk of cancer. So it's a good idea to try to have good circuit function. What can you do to improve it besides healthy diet and avoiding toxins? Get your exercise, get your sunshine. You get your adequate potassium and magnesium from eating your plants. Manage your stress. Avoid unnecessary stress. Sometimes reframing your attitude can be helpful, you know, because if you see certain things in a positive way, then the stress doesn't have negative connotations for you. You know, like for me, like, let's say I have to prepare a presentation. Well, I kind of find it fun to prepare a presentation. So it motivizes me, it motivates me, it energizes me. So that's good. That's called reframing your attitude. And for some things you can do that. For other things you won't be able to do, but for, do it for the things that you can. Uh, magnesium has other benefits. You get that from eating plants. It blocks the NMDA channel, the receptor uh, in the brain for glutamate. So it, it helps to prevent excitotoxicity. Okay, now we're going to, so that was a big uh, discussion of Circo. We're going to cover things a little bit different here. Okay, here's the next fairy tale. What does Hansel and Gretel remind you of? Okay, so the mama of Hansel and Gretel was dead. And I'll call that appreciation for natural human nature and health. And the stepmother, which is sort of the modern fake science that pretends to be real science from big pharma and big food, um, has taken them into the woods and abandoned them so that they might starve to death because... They didn't have enough food at their regular house. And, you know, initially they did uh, pebbles, which worked. But then the second time they were taken out into the woods, they had breadcrumbs and the birds ate them and they were lost. They see the gingerbread candy house and the witch invites them in. And at first it seems like a good thing. They're getting all this tasty food, which is processed food with MSG and salt and fat added to it. And the witch is fattening up. She's going to eat them. And I said, it's kind of like big food fattening people up so big pharma can take their money because they get sick and need to take a bunch of pills. And the witch is a cannibal is getting ready to eat them. All these fires lately is the witch getting ready to eat you. And can and Hansel was in prison, but luckily they escaped. Okay. So anyways, getting back to this idea of the fires, 
it reminds me now of when Troy was burning. Okay. There was the book, you know, the Iliad was about the Trojan war. Okay. Because Helena Troy had been taken away uh, by the guy named Paris. Okay. It's a long story, but in the end, Troy was conquered by the Greeks and the Trojans, many of them died. They perished in the fire, but Aeneas, this painting is actually of the last days of Pompeii, but it's pretty much the same story as the last day of Troy. I'll show you the painting of Troy. So this is Aeneas. And when he was a Trojan and when Troy was burning, they recognized the disaster and he carried his father. This is his father, Anchises. And it was a symbolic thing for Aeneas to carry out Anchises out of burning Troy. And what it symbolizes was the idea of the younger generation must carry on the learning and the wisdom of the older generation. Okay. And it reminds me of this quote here by Will Durant. He's a great historian. He said, the best a man can do is to learn about the good things in civilization and to try to transmit this to the next generation. If a man is fortunate, he will, before he dies, gather up as much as he can of his civilized heritage and transmit it to his children. And to his final breath, he will be grateful for this inexhaustible legacy, knowing that it is our nourishing mother and our lasting life. Civilization is not inherited. Civilization has to be learned. And if the transmission of the knowledge of civilization is interrupted, civilization will die. Okay, so Anchises did the right thing, carrying the knowledge and wisdom of his father, Anchises, out from Troy. And when I heard this and saw this, I realized what I must do. So here in this modern world, I'm carrying out the knowledge of Dr. McDougall and our other forefathers of nutrition. And I can imagine what Dr. McDougall will say if I try to carry him on my shoulder. Put me down, you arrogant little upstart. I will kick your ass. I'm the fighting Irish. It's okay, John. It's okay. So anyways. All right. Now here is Rip Van Winkle. So Rip Van Winkle is a story by Washington Irving, whereby he fell asleep for a long time. And like over 20 years. And when he woke up, he was amazed at how much the world had changed. And what am I talking about? They're now talking about DBS for depression. DBS is like deep brain stimulation for depression, okay? And I'm saying this is what happens when doctors forget the old ways and don't know nutrition. They rush to complex things, you know, pharmaceuticals and surgeries. And I'm saying this is like crazy to me, okay? You walk into a, a modern psychiatry suite and you're off of powerful chemicals, which might be helpful in the short term, like for a psychotic episode, but in the long run, they can have the effect of being like a chemical lobotomy, okay? And then you can also get electroshock therapy, convulsive therapy, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, which causes a seizure, all right? And that can have an effect similar to an electrical lo partial lobotomy, okay? And now they're talking about DBS and other surgical procedures like a surgical lobotomy. Option number four, run for your life. And I'm kind of joking there, but what I'm saying is you should exhaust all the minimally invasive safe things if you if you've got the time now if you got somebody who's you know more severely ill and they might need to go to pharmaceuticals initially there might be special cases when that is the case but diet can have significant effect on mood um, avoiding toxins can have an effect getting one's exercise talking to friends and family prayer religion role models mentors figures sometimes they can help sometimes reading about people who've recovered from depression avoiding any substance abuse having a new purpose you know all I'm saying is nowadays, if the drugs don't work, electroshock is often tried, which causes a seizure. And if electroshock don't work, they sometimes will go with this DBS, deep brain stimulation, where they'll cut a hole in the skull and place an electron. And what I'm trying to say is that's a pretty dramatic thing. And, you know, I would just make sure you tried all this stuff before you go to something like this. I think to, to go to this almost seems a little crazy, in my opinion. And I do have a lot of knowledge of psychiatry. My father was a psychiatrist, okay? So I would talk to him, okay? And I think he had an exaggerated... My dad was a good guy. He never once lied to me. He was smart. He was nice. And he was did you say he, he was a psychiatrist or a psychologist? My father was a psychiatrist. Wow. So he was quite involved with all this neuropsychopharmacology. I actually considered being a psychiatrist, but I didn't I didn't see it as being that challenging to me at the time. Uh, but in, in, in retrospect, you know, I like the brain and as a psychiatrist, anything you read about the brain, it kind of carries over to your job. So that might've been an okay thing in the long run, but I, you know, I'm, I, I can see, I learned so much about 
what you can do with medications to lower anxiety and stuff. So I would optimize all that stuff before I would jump to the pills, but okay, here's, here's a neuron, you know, again, we show the cell body up here. Here's the axon, the action potentials transmitted from the cell body really initiates typically the axon hillock transmitted to the axon terminal calcium comes in neurotransmitter vesicle merges with the plasma membrane diffuses across the synaptic cleft, exerts an effect on the postsynaptic neuron so here it is with the calcium so the action potential calcium comes in neurotransmitter goes across the cleft here's a dopamine synapse for example the dopamine travels across the synapse binds with the dopamine receptor so da is for dopamine r is for receptor and exerts an effect on the postsynaptic neuron if you give an antipsychotic what it'll do is it'll block let's say the dopamine receptor and then you'll have less of a dopamine effect. It's thought that psychosis like schizophrenia is thought especially associated with dopamine uh, increased amounts in the synapse. A lot of these um, theories are quite oversimplified. They're much less um, accurate than people think. So here's a simple synapse, let's say for serotonin. Serotonin is released, goes across the cleft, binds to the postsynaptic receptor, and then it's taken back up in the serotonin reuptake transporter. So those are called certs, okay, a cert. Okay, so if you give a drug like a typical antidepressants, you know, like Prozac or any of the other antidepressants that are serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, they're called SSRIs, they will inhibit this serotonin reuptake, all right? But compensatory things will happen on the neuron. The neuron might make more certs, okay? Uh, the postsynaptic neuron, because now there's going to be more serotonin in the cleft, might downregulate some of those receptors. So it has fewer receptors, okay? The presynaptic neuron might uh, make fewer uh, serotonin vesicles. So what happens, what I'm trying to say is when you take one of these pills, compensatory adaptations happen in the neuron and they can become much more complex than you would first expect because the neuron quite often isn't just one simple synapse of a presynaptic and a postsynaptic neuron. That's illustrated to get the general idea. But in the real world, it's often more like a symphony and there's multiple synapses all interacting together. And when you start changing one of them with a drug, all kinds of compensatory adaptations are happening around them. And what I'm getting at is you might find yourself in a place where it's harder to get back to your original normal, okay? And I'm kind of joking. What did uh, Dorothy say in The Wizard of Oz? There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And so what I'm trying to say is be careful about excessive uh, neuropsychopharmacology and staying on them a prolonged amount of time, or you can get adaptive changes in your neurons that might be very hard to recover back to normal from. And a lot of them have cognitive impairment effects in the, in the long run. All right, so we won't go into any more about that. What I'm basically saying is there are things that make you healthy and you want to increase in your these in your life, your exercise. We talked about that activates the AMPK pathway, the adenosine monophosphate pathway, which is maintenance and restoration and just maintaining a healthy, steady state, your sunshine, friendships, good relationships, laughter, um, you know, having a purpose in life, an attitude of gratitude. All of this stuff makes you healthier. The low-fat vegan starch-based diet, all right? And then you want to avoid all these things that make you sicker. We talked about the poor diet. Today, we talked about circa inhibitors, mitochondrial inhibitors, uh, mitochondrial inhibitors and excitotoxins. So it's worth your time to learn about this. You know, like Socrates had said, we should learn about what is good for us and what is bad for us and then choose what is good for us, okay? And there's a lot of stuff to know here, but simply being aware of it is the hardest part because once you're aware of it, you can learn it and then learn how to avoid it and just do that and you'll be healthier. That's how you get healthier. And you have to be willing to do it, you know, and you can't just, you know, be like the burden's burden's ass or the mule that couldn't make up its mind and couldn't commit. Just commit for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and then you can always change your mind and see what happens. Okay. And so, and I actually think that's kind of like a big secret to long-term health is that, you know, as you get older and you kind of see how the world works, you realize that we're all kind of in this game together and we need to help each other. If we all help each other, we'll have a longer springtime and a shorter winter and we all benefit, you know, that ripple effect, everybody's better off. So Keep that in mind. And as you learn, you can help more people around you if they're willing to listen to you for what that's worth. So anyways, that, that's our talk for today about um, myths and fairy tales and their relationship to nutrition and health and the vegan diet. Mm, so, nice. I'm going to stop the screen share for you so we can see you nice and big. Boy, do you ever lecture at medical schools? Um, I do some, yeah. And, and, and medical students love having me teach. You know, it's, it's sort of though, they're a little afraid to invite somebody talking about vegan nutrition at a medical institution, though, where the main thing they do is sell drugs. But the medical students love it. I've had medical students come up and thank me. And I actually, I have a little joke I play with medical students. Here's what I say to them. I say, I can read your mind. I know you better than you know yourself. 
I'll say within one hour of speaking to you, I can teach you more than you learned about helping people in your entire college education and your entire medical school education. And if you're a resident, your entire residency. I know that from experience because they will have studied, let's say a senior medical student, let's say a resident, a senior resident in internal medicine. I will, they won't know anything because they're, they're, they're taught. Basically, here's how conventional medicine works. It tells the students that everything has an unknown cause or it's genetic. Because if it's an unknown cause or genetic, then they have to buy a drug or it's a deficiency. So deficiency, you have to treat it with the drug to replace the deficiency. Genetics, there's nothing you could do, take our drug. Unknown cause, nothing you could do, take our drug. That's what it all, that's what all their book chapters are. And that's why, like when I was a young guy, I used to think the big, I was first in my class, 333 students. I used to think the big pathology textbook out of Harvard was just like this great book, you know, the great learning of mankind. Here it all is in this book. Now I look at the book as like a comic book, a joke. And I say that because you look at the, the chapter on, on atherosclerosis. They don't know what causes atherosclerosis. I do. Okay. You look at the chapter on coronary artery disease and atherosclerosis as it relates to the coronary. They will say, we don't know what really causes it. High cholesterol contributes to it. Treatment is a pill, a stent, or an open heart surgery versus look at Esselstyn, 198 patients in a row, four years. No current events in the patient, recurrent events in the patients who filed the diet, okay? Look at Ornish's data on reversing coronary artery disease and, and all the other ones too, okay? Um, you know, look at Kempner, for example. And then what I'm saying is it's like that for everything, just about all the common diseases, autoimmune diseases. They don't even mention leaky gut. They don't even mention chemical mechanisms of transforming cells into, um, into PAMPs and DAMPs, okay? Um, you know, damage associated molecular pathological patterns. Okay. They don't even mention that. All right. And it goes like that for like every chapter on MS. You won't ever see swank mentioned. Okay. And the abdominal diseases, you'll never see Burkitt mentioned. They don't talk about fiber and the effect it has on, you know, uh, attracting water into the stool and preventing abdominal pressure syndrome. I was amazed when I, when I came to these conclusions, when you have traumatic brain injury, you get leaky gut. None of the neurologists know that, okay? Um, and so they don't include management of leaky gut in their treatment of traumatic brain injury or in their treatment of uh, stroke. But it should be because you've got an ischemic penumbra adjacent to the major uh, site of necrosis that you're trying to preserve. Well, you need to know that because simultaneously when you have traumatic brain injury or a stroke, you're also gonna have increased blood brain barrier permeability while you have increased intestinal permeability. And so you're gonna get more toxins coming across that leaky gut and they're gonna have more access to the brain because you got leaky blood brain barrier. So you need to know that, okay? But no one knows that in conventional medicine. So it could be tremendously beneficial. I'll, I'll tell you, any hospital in the Western world, I could dramatically improve their outcomes if they would invite me to teach the doctors. But none of them will because there's no money in it, okay? No one ever invites me anywhere. <laughs> it's a fact. Yeah, we invite you back every month for Chef AJ Live. I'm, I'm grateful for that. I love uh, yeah. being, being well, on your well, show. That yeah. quote you said, the more money in the disease, the less likely there is to find a cure. That's pretty profound. Yeah. And it's, and in my experience, it's true. Wow. Well, I have a few questions that uh, live viewers have sent in, if you wouldn't mind answering them. Sure. Okay. So the first one is from Allie. Dr. Rogers, are, if Botox cosmetics or Botox for migraines, either one, do they have any effects on the brain or possibly for dementia in the future? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't work with Botox, so I wouldn't know, but if it was me, I would see if I could solve my problem some other way first before I would do that. I mean, maybe that person needs that. Maybe it helps them. Great. But I'm just saying is I have found that most of my problems, I can usually solve them just by paying attention. I always ask myself for any disease, what causes this disease? Because once you know what causes the disease, if you want to get better, you avoid the thing that causes it. That tends to be the best way to treat most things. And then I also ask myself, how can I build up this system? Like, let's say I have a physical weakness. Well, I'll just lift weights or exercise that area and make it stronger. And, you know, so you can't always fix things in that way, but as much as you can, I always try that first. Right. Thank you. Um, Heidi asks, is it best to eat a raw vegan diet or to include cooked foods, assuming both are quality, whole food, plant-based, no oil, sugar, et cetera? All raw is more challenging, but is it worth the extra effort? Well, an interesting person is Ruth Heydrich. Ruth Heydrich, you know, she's the famous super survivor of breast cancer. Uh, she said she became a vegan in two hours after talking to Dr. McDougall, and she initially ate the starch-based uh, vegan diet for many years, for decades, and her cancer never came back. 
she had extensive cancer that had spread locally and was, you know, very poor prognosis. She's supposed to be dead within a year. And then she later on switched to eating a raw vegan diet. And she also was on that for over a decade. And that has worked well for her too. So in her opinion, both work. And I would expect they would both work. I would see the potential problem is be careful with the raw vegan diet that you might start eating a lot of fats because you might have a hard time getting adequate caloric intake versus it's easy to get your calories when you're eating a starch-based diet. And starch means cooked food. Um, I would see that as the potential pitfall. Um, you know, So I think you'd be okay with either one of them. And nowadays too, until you know what types of coatings are put on the fruits, I'm eating less fruits until I have that figured out. Um, and if I had to come up with a Greek myth fairy tale story, I would go with Ariadne and Theseus. And that's the one where he had to battle the Minotaur within the labyrinth. And Ariadne gave him the string, the ball of thread, the string that he used to find his way into the labyrinth so he could find his way out. Okay, so what am I saying with that? What was the point of that, that, that metaphor? It was that the starch is the starch is the thread, Ariadne's thread that you can use to save yourself and pull yourself out of the inevitable, you know, um, suffering and stuff that everybody does with chronic disease. And that's why I said, that was why I joked, Amazing Starch from Amazing Grace, the song, because if you only know one thing, I would say the most thing, most valuable thing I ever learned from a health point of view in all of my college, med school, two fellowships, residency, et cetera, was that humans are made to eat starch. That's like the most valuable thing you could know. And, and I say, we should all know that, you know, the zookeeper knows what to feed the animal. Why don't human doctors and health coaches know you should feed people starch? It's the most valuable thing you could know. And just go study it, study it as much as you can. And, and the more you study it, the more true you'll see it is. And fruits are also very good. The next best thing I think after starch is fruits. But just make sure they're not. Well, you wait, do you think fruits are better than vegetables? Well, I think vegetables are great for all the nutrition, but they just can't satisfy your hunger. They don't have enough calories in them. Um, and in my experience, they're harder to get. I don't know why it is. Maybe it's because where I live or how I shop, but I always find it like you can buy frozen fruits. There's not as many frozen vegetables in my experience. You can't get some. And I know some people do that. Um, and I should maybe start doing that, but I always find them like I'll buy a bunch of salads and I'll eat them all. And I'll still have other food, plenty of starches and fruits. So then it'll be a couple of days. Um, sometimes I miss out on my salads a little bit, but I, I try to eat like at least one, if not two salads every day. That's great. Because the next question, actually, there is a question about the ratio. I have another one, but first, let me get to this one. This is from Marsha. What do you do about hair loss on a whole food plant-based diet? How to stop it and what to do about it? Well, I don't know. Hair, hair loss can be multifactorial. It can be partly genetic. You know, they say you tend to be have hair loss like your father did. Uh, but the other, you know, for men, the other thing about hair loss is I think about it, you know, look at yourself when you stand up. The hardest spot to get blood is the top of your head. It's the farthest away from your heart going against gravity. So it's also shown that people who eat uh, diets that are atherogenic, you know, high fat diets, high sodium diets, especially the high fat and that have more atherosclerosis, they're predisposed and at a higher risk of becoming bald. And they used to think that that was part of why Asian men who ate a predominantly rice diet uh, were less likely to go bald and that there's increasing uh, baldness as Asian populations are eating more high fat diets is what I've heard. I haven't studied that in great detail. So I'm not, I don't want plain to be an expert on the subject. Um, and I'm, I'm not aware of, I have not studied hair loss that much. I, I actually have a funny story about, it. I don't know if we need to go into it, but yeah, sure. Uh, I used to think hair loss was such a big deal. And, you know, I like, I liked this girl when I was about 30 years of age or 31 or something, and she didn't want to go out with me. And I couldn't understand why. And I thought maybe it's because I'm starting to go bald. So I uh, thought it was, I think it was because I was, I didn't have that. I was a little bit bald, not rot, just kind of a little bit. And so I asked my brother, my older brother, he's only one year older than me, but he thinks he's like, he like thinks he's like 10 years older than me. And he's real kind of like rude to me and kind of insulting me. He's like, Pete, don't do it. He goes, I know how you are. You think you know what you're doing, but you're stupid. Do not, because I thought about going to a hair club for men and getting a, and getting a, like a hair rep I didn't even know what they did. They, they put a toupee on your head. He goes, he goes, listen, you stupid idiot. I know how you think you know what you're doing. You don't, you're stupid. Now you listen to me. I don't care what they tell you. Everyone will be able to tell and you're going to look like an idiot and it's not going to look good. So don't do it. And you better listen to me. You don't fucking listen to me. You should listen to me. Okay. And I'm like, okay. And then I had, I was going out to Boston that year and um, it was like a new start for me, right? Leaving Chicago to go to Boston. And so 
I figured now's the perfect time to do it. So I went to the hair club for men there. And first a lady talks to me and she goes, oh, you have too much hair. I don't think you need our procedure. She goes, let me talk to my manager. So she goes back, she talks to the manager. The manager goes, oh, no, 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 you'd be a fine customer because the manager has more experience, wants the money, okay? And I'm a stupid young guy, um, you know, broken heart, this girl wouldn't go out with me. So anyways, I get the thing, okay? And so my brother had a friend in Boston and these two young ladies, they're both lawyers. You know, my brother's a lawyer. They, and they took me out and they gave me a little tour of Boston. They took me to Faneuil Hall, like a famous tourist site in Boston. And we're at this uh, cafe. And it's like a big mall with the streets closed off. And so I'm turning my head to talk to the waiter. And out of the corner of my eye, I see him pointing to my head. This is like right my first week going out to Boston. I go, man, it's going to be a long year. I can't believe I did this. My brother was right. And so anyways, because I did get the hair, the hair toupee thing, okay? Because I thought that was the, what, what made a difference, okay? And then I noticed all these bald guys with nice girlfriends, nice women. I'm like, I'm an idiot. I can't believe I did this. Luckily, I'm in Boston. So right when I came back to Chicago with my next job, I had the I had the thing removed and I never went back to that again. But it was an embarrassing moment. It was another... I told you so for my older brother who always makes fun of me. That's funny. Okay. Um, this, you were talking about your hierarchy, starch first, then fruit, then vegetables. And Jane said, Dr. Rogers recently said his diet was approximately 55% starch, 40% fruit, and 5% veggies. Why is the veggie component so low? Well, I would eat more vegetables if they were convenient, but I find that they're the fastest thing I keep running out of. Um, I do like eating the veggies and I've noticed, you know, like Ruth Hydras, she uh, was riding her bike training for her marathons and triathlons. She got hit by a truck and she had a big comminuted fracture in her leg and she healed super fast. And she thinks it's from eating all those salads and look at Caldwell Esselstein now recommending his, you know, more serious cardiac patients eat a bunch of greens all day long, like six different servings all day long to keep having more nitric oxide because that vasodilator improves your healing. So I do think in a perfect world of everything is available. You got to remember, I'm like a, I'm a triple boarded physician who works long hours most of the time. I don't have a lot of time and I just eat OMAD diet when I come home. And um, basically salads run out a lot of times. Like, oh man, I'm running out of salads. I got to get back to the store one of these days. So it's just a question of availability. I mean, if I like had a perfect control, I would eat, you know, at least two salads every day, but it's just a little difficult for me to get them, but I think they're, I think they're great. And I do recognize the benefits of all the nitrates leading to systemic nitric oxide, vasodilation, which lowers your cancer risk, lowers your atherosclerosis risk. Nice. Um, Paul said that you had expressed your concern over the usage of appeal and what can people do if they're concerned about it? Who can they write to? Um, I know a few things about it. For example, Natural Grocers is a grocery store chain. They're, they're, I think they're based out of like Colorado or something like that. You can go to their website and then click on store locator and you can see where all their stores are. So they don't use it at all in their stores. Earthbound Farms is an organic salad making company. I think they're based in California. I don't know for sure. I think they got a couple of locations they're based and they claim to not have it in any of their food products. I know they grow a lot of stuff in greenhouses where they'll even say zero pesticides of any kind have been used on their food. So supposedly they don't use it. However, I can also tell you, I went to their website and, and I tried to click it. I put that into the search menu and I couldn't find the word APIL on there. So I don't know. It's like, why don't you guys talk about it? Please tell us, why don't you put it? If any company wants to sell more of their product, they could just put it on there. We don't use APIL, no GMO, you know, whatever, because it is a lot on organic food. So for what it's worth, that seems to be one thing you could do. Um, what else could you do? Um, I had a set of blueberries that I used to eat. And then I noticed that they used to often look quite irregular. And all of a sudden they changed the packaging and they all look perfect. So I said to myself, they're probably putting that stuff on it. I stopped eating them. Okay. And that's pretty much my attitude. If I, if I sense the type of change like that, I'm pretty sensitive to things like that. I won't eat the product. Um, it's thought to be more common in stuff that's displayed in open packages, you know, like to just have like, almost like a netting around it. Um, avocados are supposedly the worst, like the earliest and the most often they have that stuff on there. Apples are supposed to be the next most commonly uh, coated in that stuff. I would recommend that avoid it as much as you can. Um, and I wish I knew everything else that it was on, but I don't. And I wish it was easier to find. I searched around quite a bit, but that was, that was weeks ago. I should do another search to try to study it. Maybe new information has come about. Yeah. But, maybe you can talk, if you find anything, maybe you can talk about it next month because, you know, do they even test this? Do they, do they say things that are generally regarded as safe and then wait until consequences occur? My experience is that basically regulatory societies are a joke. I hate to say it, but you're on your own. You cannot expect regulatory societies to do the right thing or even to know what they're talking about. Basically the way it works is 
big food companies, they have budgets of billions of dollars per year and they can do whatever they want. You know, imagine you're some guy working in one of these, you know, regulatory societies that's supposed to make sure the food is safe. And the big food company tells you, look, pal, just give us approval. And then you could retire next year and join our company. We'll pay you, you know, uh, 600,000 bucks a year. You only have to work, you know, four hours a week. Just don't mess with us. And the guy goes, okay. And that's it. And so you can't trust them to protect the food supply. They're, they're not going to do it. And because of that, you, you have to you have to try to understand things as best you can. I can tell you a story. One time my, my son came to me and he was kind of pissed off and sad. He's in grade school. It was many years ago. And he said, dad, the teacher ripped him off, gave him a bad grade on a, on a, on a, on a paper he wrote. It was unfair. And I said, yeah, I think she did kind of screw you over. But unfortunately, that's kind of how life is. And it's not a big deal. I said, imagine you had a rabbit walking down a path in the forest, okay? And the rabbit looks up in one tree and there's a hawk. And he's kind of scared the hawk might come down and kill him. He looks out on the other way and he sees a snake. And he's scared the snake might kill him. And then he looks out another way and there's a couple coyotes and he's afraid the coyotes might kill him. And I said, that's how life is. You just have to learn how the world is and then figure out how to navigate. You know, the rabbit should make a system of burrows. The rabbit should pay attention to the birds of the forest. They're the early warning system. He should make friends with the other animals and they can help each other. And I said, that's about the best you could do. Um, and the world just is the way it is. And it's never going to change. And that's what I'm trying to say is, you know, people say, oh, should we write a letter? Should we do this? And I, my attitude is don't waste your time. They're always going to have billions of dollars, all these food companies. They're always going to get whatever lobbying they want. They're always going to substitute one chemical or toxin or pesticide for another. So you can't change that. All you can do is try to understand it and then try to navigate more effectively. And what am I doing at this point? I'm eating more starches. I'm only buying earthbound earth farms for salads. And um, of the fruits I eat, I'm eating more frozen. And that's about the best I can do at this time. And I'm, I'm asking around. I go to the store and I ask everybody, but almost always the people working in the produce, they don't know anything. The customer service person doesn't know anything. They told me that you can come earlier in the day and speak to our buyer people. The buyer people buy stuff for the store and they apparently have more knowledge of what's what. Um, I haven't done that yet, but that's a, per that's a thing a person could do. Um, keep on searching around online, search a bunch of different sites and see if you can find some useful information. I've done that in the past and I found a little bit of information, but not as much as I had hoped. Yeah. Well, you're coming back next month in October and that's the month of Halloween. And I'm curious, what do you give out to trick-or-treaters? Oh, well, I kind of defer all of that kind of stuff to the wife because um, it, it's just kind of easier. And I mean, I don't know, just to briefly to put it all in the story, the old house that we had was sort of my house and it was great. It was like a health club and a gym. I had backyard tennis court, basketball court, pool. I had an indoor basketball court. I had an indoor racquetball court. I made all these things. I converted the rooms into it and I drove my wife crazy. She was so mad at me that it almost caused us to get divorced and we had to move to a new house, but it's like a female house in the sense that it looks real pretty. If you come in, you go, oh, this is so lovely. Okay, but if you actually live in it, you know, it's hard to exercise. I don't know how to explain it, but it's not designed for a guy wanting to exercise, which is sort of like my, and what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is it's my wife's house and <laughs> she does everything. I don't do anything. And, and at first I was kind of sad. Um, I, even my son said to me, dad, I can't believe you followed mom to this house. I have lost all respect for you. And I'm like, listen, pal, I did it for your benefit. Oh. Okay, Keep the family together. And so, but what, what happened though, something good happened in the new house that it used to be the old house. Everything was my problem. I have to cut the grass. I have to pay all the bills. I have to manage the pool. It took a lot of time. Now I do nothing. And that frees me up to have more time to write, more time to make YouTube videos. And I like that. So it actually ended up being okay. Wow. That's, you're funny. But do you happen to know what she hands out? No, but she doesn't care too much about it. It's kind of like she kind of thinks more in a conventional conformist way and thinks I'm a little bit of an autistic, crazy person. But I can tell you this, the older we get, I'm just about 60 years of age, okay? I'm totally fit, strong, smart. I can concentrate 12 hours in a row. I got great energy for lifting weights and exercise. And so it's like everybody looks around and go, I, I think I'm exercising. I'm aging better than anyone I know in my age group, all the doctors my age. And it's sort of like, it all, my kids are like, oh, dad, you know, you're doing pretty good for an old guy. And so what I'm trying to say is the older we get, the more obvious it is that I'm doing all these things the right way. And so she's gradually kind of coming around to it. She's like, oh God. Uh, so it, it is what it is. And all her, all her lady doctor friends and stuff, they're all kind of like, oh, wow, you're really aging pretty well. So it's kind of funny, but it takes a long time. It's almost like that's what it takes. 
all the science and the logic doesn't convince people. I've had a patient too, where I try to tell the guy about atherosclerosis and diet, and he sort of doesn't get it. And then he goes for a coronary artery calcium uh, CAT scan of his heart and gets a calcium score. And he finds out he got a lot of calcium in his coronary arteries. He's all scared and he's worried. And now he's a little more motivated. And I'm like, to me, I just understand it from reading about it. I don't need to go do something like a calcium CT, which I think in general is stupid because you radiate yourself. I don't know the exact con conversion thing, but I, I think it's something like more than 10,000 chest X-rays. It's like, why would I want to expose myself to all that radiation when you already know the answer, like William Roberts said, you know, the cardiac pathologist, if you eat a high fat diet, all herbivores get atherosclerosis. Every single human gets atherosclerosis. They eat that way. So you don't, you don't need to check. You already know you got it. So just eat the Esselstyn, low fats, low sodium, vegan, et cetera. And then you prevent it from progressing and you'll actually regress it partially. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Rogers. It's so interesting every time you come on. Yeah. Well, thanks. Okay. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 11 a.m. tomorrow for plant-based classics with Lauren Burnick. She's going to be making mandarin orange tofu and mandarin orange cauliflower, vegan, of course, and without the oil. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.